I've let's see. Okay. Right. Waiting for it to pop up on the channel. I'm checking as well. Yes. I think there's a 30 second delay. All right. All right, mine has started. We are live on mine. Oh no, mine canceled. one comment on mine uh, I'll, just, I'll just update the people who are watching this one uh, hey everyone we're uh, you know this is the first of uh, first try at this joint live stream so we're trying to start up give us a few more minute moments while Chris gets started I just canceled my broadcast apparently <laughs> um, okay so yeah mine um, mine went bad I'm not sure what happened we'll find out so I'm creating a brand new one, and we'll go from there. Um, cool. Uh, people can see you on, on uh, my channel. OK, that's, <laughs> that's fine. I will. Um, yeah. So good times. Good times, everyone. Let's see if I can get this thing up and running. I will copy this out, and I will delete one and recreate the other. Okay, cool. okay. All right, let's see if we can start streaming. Okay, where it looks like we're streaming. And for this one, I will set this to private. Done. I will have to edit that video. Okay. We'll leave it at that. Channel content. No, cancel and save it. Well, I hate it when that happens. Every once in a while it does. So I will be doing a live one. There we go. That one is going. Okay, cool. Okay. And for the previous one, if anyone's on there, I will... I don't have anyone on there, but... Um... Uh... I hate it when that happens. <laughs> I think everything's good. Issues. Yep. In fact, it does not work. So, okay, it gives me a moment to um, drink some water. No, no views streamed two minutes ago. Okay, that's fine. I've got the other one. I didn't get any water. I probably should have. <laughs> I'll, I'll email okay. you some of mine. All right. So we'll see. We'll see who pops on my stream. We'll see who pops on on yours. Cool. Um, if you see any any chats, go ahead and let me know, and we'll go ahead and answer them. We'll do. Uh, okay. We'll Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Let's start. Uh oh, this is going to start us off. Um, okay, so we were going to talk about um, the eclipse today. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're going to talk about the eclipse in general. What's special about this eclipse? Um, what we're both planning. Uh, I have plans. You got plans. Mm -hmm. So I guess we should also introduce ourselves. Right. So um, want to go first? Sure. Um, hey everyone, I'm Naz. I live on the outskirts of Boston. I've been doing astronomy for closer to 16 or 17 years using very basic equipment. Uh, I didn't actually start doing like serious astrophotography until 2012. Uh, and this is going to be my third total solar eclipse and I'm really excited for it. Uh, we'll be driving from Boston to Austin. Um, I'll have four imaging rigs uh, and a baby uh, in the car. So we're taking four days to drive there. So we'll see how, how the trip goes. I'll try and keep everyone uh, posted on my progress if I am uh, still alive. Okay. I'm Chris Modnitsky with the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. Um, I am ideally staying at home. Uh, by home, I mean the Dallas Fort Worth area. Uh, if the weather is good, I plan on being just south of Fort Worth about half an hour. We have some family land there. Uh, my cousins live there and they have their business there. We will be setting up there, um, and we'll have four minutes, about 10, 11 seconds of totality. Uh, I'll have my imaging rigs. Um, there are a lot. They're 
we've been setting them up for the last two days just in the the room back here you may be able to see some of the telescopes <laughs> through the through the glass not very well uh, but i did take some pictures i can show them off later um there's a lot so uh i'm my my idea is i'll be imaging for um various focal lengths and i'm imaging for different things i'm imaging for uh the wider corona and i'm also going to be imaging for prominences and um this time i will not be doing uh phases of the eclipse mm. i will not be taking any phase images per se instead i will be doing a time lapse again if everything goes well of a uh, of the sun and hydrogen alpha including the eclipse but at the point of totality there's no point in doing anything with hydrogen alpha because we really can't see anything so i will be having video cameras on there at that point and then if our weather is bad uh we're gonna drive down closer to you mm -hmm. because we'll be in fredericksburg yep yep yeah and we'll be near marble falls uh for anyone wondering where i'll be so it's along the path of totality. How many? Uh, how much time do you have there where you'll be at? Four minutes, 17 seconds. Okay. What about you? I have four minutes, 10 seconds. Exactly <laughs> what I have here. <laughs> so um, we also may be doing a, uh, this is actually kind of a, a good test because my friend who was just here just left a couple minutes ago, um, he's the one who's getting the, the house down there. And uh, if the weather is good in both locations, I'm going to try to set up a streaming rig for him down there, so he will be able to, we'll do something like this, a Zoom session, and get his feed in so that we can see the eclipse a couple of minutes early. I think it starts at um, uh, three, or sorry, one thirty-three or so mm -hmm. where he's at, mm -hmm. and then it ends at uh, one thirty-six ish, one thirty-two to one thirty-six. And then it starts here at 139. So we'll have just a few minutes Interesting. Uh, when he gets done until we start totality up here in North Texas. Interesting. I think where I am, it'll start around 136.40. I think that's the that's the time. Um, okay, so end there, mm -hmm. start with you, mm -hmm. end with you, and then start with me. Yep, yep. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, yeah. Places. <laughs> okay, so uh, first things first. Um, what's a solar eclipse? Um, Solar eclipse, just at the simplest terms, is when the moon crosses in front of the, it transits in front of the face of the sun and it casts a shadow onto the earth. You can have a partial eclipse where only part of the sun is covered up. You can have an annual eclipse like we had in October mm -hmm. where the moon partially covers up the sun's face and it leaves a ring around it, a ring of fire is what we call it, or totality, when the moon is a little bit closer to us and it covers the entire face of the sun. And these are all based on location. So there's no totality for everyone on this side of the planet. It's only a very, very narrow path. And we can actually show that path in, mm -hmm. in a few minutes. Yeah. Uh, do you have any of that? Um, yeah, I'll say, um, so the difference between annularity and uh, totality in the eclipses is also dependent on where the moon is. So we get annularity when moon crosses in between the earth and the sun at its farthest point uh, so that it's just a little bit too far to cover the sun and when it's just close enough we can see totality and the length of totality depends on how close the moon is so compared to 2017 the moon is a little bit closer to earth this year because we're getting four plus minutes of totality in some areas where as in 2017 i think the max was about two and a half minutes I think I had uh, two minutes twenty seconds or so when we were in Nebraska, and we were we were pretty close to the center line. Nice, um, but it's that that center line was so narrow in mm -hmm. comparison to this year that being just a little bit further off dropped it significantly. And the other thing about having the a shorter uh, period of totality is the sky doesn't get that dark. Um, it was a dark sky; it just wasn't very very dark. So. Right. Um, we could easily see clouds, we could easily see the sky, we could see it got darker, uh, and then we could see the, the 360 degree sunset all around, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a super dark sky this time. We are hoping it will be dark enough that um, we'll be able to see uh, Jupiter, Saturn, um, 
Venus, Mars, and um, maybe even a comet. Yeah, 12P Pons Brooks. Yeah, we are hoping to get that comet. It'll be just a few degrees off of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've, I've actually calculated everything out exactly how I need it to be so that I can... Um, like I have to match a camera mm -hmm. with the lens, so I have enough of a field of view that I can capture everything without being super wide and, and not getting a whole lot of detail out of it. Right. I'm just hoping, hoping for the best. Yeah, I think I think for me uh, the comet is um, one of the lower priorities. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Are you going to bed? Not yet. Are you gonna go eat? Are you excited for the eclipse? That's you that's that's something. that's the energy. <laughs> you can say something. So. You ready? Cool. Okay. Waxy's there. <laughs> that's my son. Uh, he was with us in 2017. It was a year and a half old um, when uh, when that eclipse happened. So that's he great. does not remember it. He sees the <laughs> pictures. He doesn't remember it. And uh, kids is. Kids' brains rewrite themselves from, I think, like three or four years yep. old. Yep. So they lose those early memories mm -hmm. and they just, they they remember feelings, sort of, I guess, best way to describe it, but not actual events. So right. this is his second actual eclipse, but the only one he's going to remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be, it'll be amazing. Yeah, my son will be 11 months old, so I have no hope that he'll even look up during totality. We'll try. We'll have, we'll have glasses ready for him. For, for for the partial eclipse but you know uh, uh, he he may look up because stuff changes that's like, true the sky yeah. is different everything mm -hmm. was different so he was he didn't know what the commotion was and it's hard to explain to a kid exactly what's going to happen especially when they're that young but um you know when everything starts to change and everyone's cheering and everyone's looking around but he'll look around too <laughs> yeah that's, yeah I'll, I'll let you know how it goes so we'll, we'll debrief after so we'll see um yeah, it's like the, yeah. so when the eclipse happens, if 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 you haven't been in an eclipse, um, if you've been in a partial eclipse, it's nothing like a total. Um, it's like a, a a a partial eclipse is like riding a bicycle. It's nice. It's interesting. It gets you to where you want to be. And when you see it, it's like, oh, this is this is different. Mm -hmm. This is different than walking. Mm -hmm. This is really different. And even in a deep partial eclipse, it's, okay, this gets weird. The light will get very, very weird, very close to totality. Or if you're in the, let's say, like 90 to 99% coverage area, the light will get really weird. And mm -hmm. the word I've used before is the light looks metallic. Hmm. It's really hard to describe otherwise. But the light becomes polarized or partially polarized. Mm -hmm. but the, everything looks metallic. If you're wearing a, a red shirt, the, to our eyes, the red shirt will look a little bit more gray. Mm -hmm. If you're wearing a green shirt, then your shirt will look brighter. So that's something to look out for, something to test. Right. right. Um, but as soon as you see that light, you look around and you go, oh, yeah, that's what he meant mm -hmm. by metallic. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's your, your boy may see that change too. Yeah. And the wind will get quiet. Mm hmm. The wind typically stops. Did you have that happen during the annular as well? We did, yeah. It, it got it got yeah eerily quiet. It was it was pretty breezy beforehand, and it was interesting. And I know there's a there's also like an eclipse breeze where the the breeze follows the shadow, and it comes through. Um, I think we felt that very slightly. It wasn't something that I was looking for, but I do remember the wind just completely dying down uh, during totality. It was it was interesting. The temperature also dropped so much that it got chilly. It was 85 degrees when I was setting up. I was sweating, and then, and then uh, temperature dropped 20 degrees. It was 65 degrees. It was really pleasant. 85 and you were sweating. 85. Yeah, yeah. I'm from the, I'm from New England. <laughs> yeah, I know Texas. It's 85. Oh, that that's that's a nice cool spring day. <laughs> I know it's it's the opposite. You know, I used to live in New York, and we'd get uh, tourists from Florida uh, in the spring. You know, it was, it'd be 65 degrees, and they're like, "Oh my God, it's so cold." You know, and I'm like, "This is summer." <laughs> so I actually have one of these things, and um, I I found this in my box of filters and everything from 2017. And this is a it's a little temperature logger. 
Nice. And it's a USB, so it writes it to a, a CSV file. That's cool. And the way it works is you just it just needs a little coin battery. Yeah. You plug it in, or no, you don't plug it in. You spend the coin battery. You turn it on, mm -hmm. and um, and start recording. And it will keep recording. Um, I, I don't know how much it stores. I really just don't. But um, it'll. It's just a text file. It doesn't yeah, take up yeah. much space. Awesome. And uh, I left it recording last time, and it it has data. And I, <laughs> I managed to pull it off. And you have this nice little graph where temperatures the same, temperatures same, and then mm -hmm. you see this. It just starts to drop off gradually a little bit, yeah. and then it just dips during totality. And then after totality is over, it comes back up. Mm -hmm. So the trick with these is. You don't put them out in the sun because they will maybe not overheat, but you're not getting an accurate measurement. Right. You're getting the radiation temperature from the sun. Mm -hmm. So you put this in the shade. Example, uh, I had this under my canopy uh, where I had all my, my laptops. Um, and uh, other than that, you would, um, not it's really, yeah, just keep it in the shade. So you would put it under something, uh, under like a, a, an eave of a house, uh, on your patio or porch just someplace out of the sun and it'll take the measurements and you just stop it after the eclipse is done and take it, plug it into your computer, pull off your data, drop it into Excel, mm -hmm. graph it out. That's a good idea. Easy yeah, I'm, I'm, I might get one. It's a, it's a nice, easy experiment that I think a lot of people can do, especially in totality. And there's a lot of science that, that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So um, I am waiting for my audio moth. I still don't have it in yet. Mm -hmm. um, this is like one of the projects uh, that um, NASA has sponsored. Um, there are actually several. And uh, uh, are you doing the Eclipse Mega Movie too? I am planning on submitting my data. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the one of the bigger ones is called the Eclipse Mega Movie, and we did this in 2017. I'll try to do it again this time. And it involves uh, citizen scientists with their telescopes and their cameras. Mm -hmm. So we're using astronomical cameras and DSLRs connected to telescopes typically between 300 and I think it's like 600 millimeters in focal length, taking bracketed pictures of the sun. So you take a fast exposures and then slower and slower and slower. You go from like one four thousandth of a second all the way up to like three, four, five seconds mm -hmm. for some telescopes. And you take those images and you do darks and flats and, and um, this technical stuff for astrophotography, but we send those in and then they get processed and we can make a movie of how that inner corona changes over the entire, was it 40 something minutes that it's going mm -hmm. to be crossing the United States. Yeah. Uh, we don't have, um, we don't have good data on inner corona. Our satellites like the, uh, the solar dynamics observatory and SOHO, those use, um, like to look at the outer corona, especially like Soho, mm -hmm. it uses uh, like a, 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 we call it like a little blocker. A, a coronagraph? Like a, yeah. What do you call that? It's like a. Um, yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's right in the middle. Yeah, I, 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 the word escapes me at the moment. <laughs> um, it is a little disc, a little black disc of metal that juts out in the middle of the frame that covers up the, the sun so that. The bright light of the sun isn't impacting onto the sensor, and instead it sees the corona all around. Mm -hmm. So there's like this hole in the middle. So that hole in the middle is where the inner corona is. We don't have really good data on that inner corona. So the Eclipse Mega Movie is is to get that kind of data about the inner corona, see what those changes are during the eclipse, and then later we have images of the outer corona, and we can correlate how changes in the inner corona go out. Right. So, yeah. That's one thing. Yeah, that should be interesting to see, at the end, at the end when the the movie comes out. Yeah, I, I wow. enjoyed twenty seventeen. So it was a. Uh, I wish I had done it then, but <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. I don't think I even knew about it until, like a week before the eclipse, and, yeah, just just prepping was was not easy. <laughs> yeah, I, I I was in there like I think when they, like within a couple of weeks of them starting that. And, and I was able to do it. Uh, nice. There's another program called the uh, Eclipse Soundscapes Project. I've, yep. And it, are you doing that too? Nope. No, I, 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 no I, th I think uh, I think I looked into that. I think they need you to be uh, w within totality a couple of days before, right? Yes. Yeah. So that's yes. not something. Yeah. So I applied for it. I didn't get picked because I didn't meet the requirements. 
sadly. Okay. Uh, I did get picked, and I do not have it yet. So I sent off an email asking, where's my audio box? Yeah. So the idea behind this project is um, to get this little box. It looks kind of like a Raspberry Pi, mm -hmm. except it isn't. And it has a high-frequency microphone and a wide-spectrum microphone. It runs on three double A's. And the intention is that you put this out wherever you're doing your, um, uh, wherever you're going to be basically for totality. And you put it there two days ahead of time. So it records for two days, then it records the day of the eclipse, and then it records for two days after. The idea behind that is you get bass lines of animal and bird sounds, mm -hmm. uh, or birds, animals, and insects. Um, and then you see what changes there are during totality, and then you get the second baseline afterwards. Mm -hmm. So they're listening for crickets primarily, uh, because crickets are apparently ubiquitous to the entire U.S. and most of North America. Everywhere you go except yep. the tundra, you're going to find crickets. <laughs> yep. So they survive absolutely everywhere in the cities and the countries. You can always hear crickets. Um, so that's what they're going for. That's what they're. That's one of the things that they want to listen to. So yep. it's again. Um, and it's called the Soundscapes Project because y with enough data, now you're hearing the natural sounds throughout a huge swath of the country. So even places that you know aren't directly in totality or that if, if they're clouded over, you're still hearing those animal sounds, bird sounds, insect sounds for that area. And you're kind of getting a baseline for what are the sounds in basically early April, early right. spring. Right. What does it sound like? And from there, um, research can probably get a lot of data, not just about totality, not just about the eclipse, but mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do remember, um, so we were on a farm in 2017. We There were uh, mini horses, goats, ducks, chickens, llamas, and it was interesting to see all of them go to bed for two minutes. It got dark. They're like, okay, it's time to head inside. And it got so loud. I remember the crickets. Like, they all came alive. It also sounded like they were cicadas. Um, the the, the high-pitched, vibrating noise. It was just everywhere. It was it was not deafening, but it was it was very loud. Um, I left my phone inside. I wanted to run in and just record the audio. But it was, it was really interesting. And then as soon as the sun came out, they all just, like, within half a second, they were like, okay, sun's up, go back to sleep. Uh, that that is weird. That is that it was very weird. It, it's weird to us because we're not used to it. Right. Yeah. But to them, it's like, oh, it's dark. Well, that's our signal. Like, it's dark and the temperature is dropping. That's our signal to to start singing. So yeah. That's yeah. What do. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 Well, this time I'm I'm uh, I'm bringing an extra camera. Just um, it, it'll be to record us, like the humans. Uh, and it'll catch sound, so I'm hoping we can get something similar. Um, you know, at least uh, at least I can sh you know, show people they can hear what I hear instead of me just telling them. But like, trust me, it was insane. <laughs> so, uh, I had a GoPro that was recording. It was like a last minute thing. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I had a all sky camera that failed, and I thought ah, I'll just use a GoPro <laughs> and just stick the GoPro on there. And actually, that video got used by Celestron for their 2017 nice. like, like users video. That's so awesome. that was kind of cool. Yeah. And I, we didn't hear any. We were on a vineyard, and it was fairly open. We we heard some crickets, but you really can't hear them on the audio because everyone is cheering. And if if you're doing it alone, that's one thing. It's like wow, this is so amazing. But you're all alone. When you're with a big group, when everyone is around you, and I think we probably had maybe 200 people across wow. that entire vineyard. Wow, yeah. And when you have that many people and everyone, it's it's starting, it's starting, and everyone's like, ah. And then when it actually hits, it's it's a really, really interesting feeling. I was using the bicycle analogy. It's like the partial is like riding a bike. Mm -hmm. You know, then this is... Um, you're being flown by a private jet with <laughs> full drink and food service and completely pampered. There's no comparison between the experiences. Right. Both are forms of transportation, but other than that, there, there's no comparison. Um, it is, for what some people have said, it's like, a, 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 for them, they said it was similar to the birth of their first child. 
that it was that kind of a feeling. It's completely overwhelming. Okay. Someone I had talked to back then um, in 2017, and he said that he had been, it was his like, I want to say it was his second or third eclipse, and he he was with someone else in that group, and it was like their tenth eclipse or something. It, they had been doing it for a while, and 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 he's setting up, he's getting his cameras camera ready and everything, and, and making sure everything's going, and then they're just watching it, and and he asked the old timer, uh, uh, he asked him like, uh, so like, when do your hands stop shaking? Like, how many <laughs> eclipses does it take before your hands stop shaking? And the guy kind of glanced over him, and he goes. Your hand stop shaking. <laughs> it's that kind of experience. So I, I would urge everyone, if you're watching, um, if you can get to the path of totality, mm -hmm. try to. If you're very very close, spend the time. Just go. It, it's it's worth it. It really is. Uh, when we went in 2017, we were we went to Omaha to visit my wife's family. We were staging from there. I rented an RV so I could take my um, my myself, my wife, my kid, my parents, my brother, and my mother-in-law. And uh, we drove up to Omaha, and then from Omaha, it was bad weather in the first couple places that we were going to go to. I called the vineyard, and it was three hours away. We drove three hours to get out there. We asked uh, my wife's family if they would please come. It'll be worth it. Just please come. No, no, I don't really want to. It's like, but it's three hour drive. It's like, uh, so yeah, when, when we got back, we're showing videos and pictures and they go, well, we probably should have gone. Like, yeah. <laughs> well, if, if anyone's watching and, and you're on the fence about driving a few hours, uh, I'm driving 30 hours. So um, if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, so, and in 2017, I think the drive was... 17 hours 16 17 hours from boston to tennessee um but it's 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 totally worth it um i wish i was renting an rv then i could take more of my imaging rigs but we're we have a minivan it's easier to park <laughs> easier to find places to park uh and i'm taking four imaging rigs and i'm hoping it fits you know i don't have a, a test minivan to test with but uh, I'm, I'm going to do a, a mock pack up next week on the corner of my room trying to measure you know like get the volume and then look up uh, minivans that are rented at this place uh, that they have available. Be like, okay, let's see if it'll fit. Uh, I have a, a small SUV, but I have a roof box. So if, if the weather is good and we stay here, um, my cousin's place is 30 minutes away. Nice. So my plan is on Saturday, if the weather is good, on Saturday morning, um, I'm already going to have stuff packed up. I'm taking Thursday and Friday off. I'll pack everything Thursday and Friday. Make sure I have everything. Put it in early Saturday morning. Drive down there. Dump everything off. Come back. Take a second load. Go back down. Drop it off. If I need a third load, I'll come back again. <laughs> so it'll be it'll be three hours of driving, but at least with, it won't be too bad. But without um, traffic, it's right down I thirty five. Okay. So it, it is. Uh, it's it's just a few minutes off the highway. So it is down thirty five. It's north of Hillsboro. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, it, on, without traffic, it's 30 minutes. So I don't anticipate Saturday morning being that bad on I-35 yet. Yeah. Worst case, I can do 40 minutes by driving through Cleburne, taking some back roads. Um, again, I, it shouldn't be too bad, but I plan to set up Saturday, uh, do my polar alignment for all my mounts on Saturday and then do, um, uh, last minute testing on Sunday, make sure all the cameras are working, work out any bugs and OBS that I have, set up the microphones, get everything, and then Sunday night, put trash bags over absolutely everything, and then um, uh, go back home or spend a night in the warehouse. So okay. one of the two. Cool. Uh, it, it, it just depends on what traffic is like, and uh, if traffic is bad, I'll just spend the night over there and then I'm, I'm up and at them first thing in Monday morning if traffic is decent if it doesn't look like it's going to be too bad I'll go back home and sleep in my own bed uh, and then get up early and, and come down yeah. so uh, if we have to go to Fredericksburg I pack Thursday leave Friday uh, spend Friday night with friends uh, in Austin 
and then we'll head out to the rental house on Saturday morning and then do the same thing, set up Saturday afternoon. But if we go down there, I have to limit what I will bring. Right. Because um, <laughs> well, there's no kill like overkill. So That's true. That's uh, I, I haven't counted um, all the, uh, um, I just haven't counted what I got. So <laughs> I will, I want this uh, share screen. Uh, here we go. Yeah, let's see. Let's see what we can see with this. Yep, I can see it. Yep. Saw this picture. Yeah. So this is, um, this is somewhat what I got. So this is a hydrogen alpha telescope. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hydrogen alpha. And this is, um, actually, I don't know if I can, oh yeah, here we go. Let me minimize that. Let's do it this way. Oh, this will be fine. So I have a hydrogen alpha telescope. I have my uh, Teleview 101. I have an 11 inch Schmidt Castle grain. And in the back I have a what is that? That's an AT, uh, Astrotech 80 millimeter scope. Nice. F7, and then this is a 80 millimeter F7.5. I have a little um, 61 millimeter mm -hmm. uh, astrograph as well. I have, I had another mount on this one, which I had to take off because I needed it for camera here. I have a television studio production camera down here. So I will, yeah, I, I've, I've got uh, lots of stuff. So my plan is um, my plan is to have as much stuff as I can, mm -hmm. as many telescopes as I can, um, and just absolutely hope for the best. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you see. I have I, I have way too many cameras, but my my idea for this is I want to be able to um, get as many images as possible from as many different focal lengths as possible. Yep. So I want to be able to focus on, well, I want to be able to get the wide angle stuff, I want to be able to capture the planets, the comet, mm -hmm. and the, the eclipse. But at the same time, I want to get the inner corona, I want to get the outer corona, I want to get prominences, yep. I want all that stuff. Right, right. right. Yeah, that's a, that's a monster setup. Um, I hope everything goes well for you. Um, you. And the number of setups you have puts mine to shape, but I'll share my screen and show you. No, no, it's... <laughs> It's, it's, uh, I, I actually posted this on Reddit, uh, last night yeah. and someone, someone posted, man, I thought my, my setup was complicated and he had a, <laughs> I think it's like an AM5 uh -huh. with a, a triple, like three that. DSLRs. Yeah. In it. yeah. I saw and that. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. It's whatever you can handle. Yeah. And, um, me, I'm automating everything. Okay? Yeah. Me too. So, and, and anyone who's trying this, if you have never done this before, don't start now. If you haven't automated it, don't try to do it manually. Enjoy the eclipse. Seriously, just enjoy the eclipse. It is the last thing you want to be doing is looking down and fiddling with the equipment, trying to fix software, trying to fix a camera, trying to plug in cables during totality because you're just going to miss it. And like those two or three seconds when you look up, oh yeah, yeah, th this is great, but I got to get my camera. Right. <laughs> it's not worth it. Yep, I agree. Um, what you got? All right, all right, let me let me share my screen. And, by the way, this is not like bragging. This is <laughs> we're not we're not bragging about what we've got. This is just ugh. This is what we have. Yep. Let's see. I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. Oh, so you have the Helio Find as well. So yeah, I've and got, one second, uh, one second, screen two. I've got one of those that was just hidden away by another telescope. <laughs> All right. All right. Zoom doesn't want to share my, my secondary screen, so I'll just show it here. Um, yeah, so I have, um, so these are, I have, these are three of my four setups. I'll show you the uh, fourth setup in a minute. So I have my 300 millimeter lens, so it's my 75 to 300 millimeter uh, stock lens on a AZ GTI. This is my newest mount I got a few months ago. Uh, works beautifully. Uh, this one is my wide field setup, which is a Samyang 14 millimeter. Uh, it'll be, it's a static setup, so I'm hoping to do just get the sun go across the sky here. So it'll just be static. Hang on just a second. Let me do exit full view. There we go. Now I can. Now you can see it. 
Yeah, uh, now this is better. Because otherwise, it was. I think. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I think I think uh, people in the stream. No, no, no. Are... It, it was all me. It was mm, all me. No, people in the stream aren't seeing it. Um, one second. Oh. Uh, gotta gotta look, gotta love technology. Uh, let's see. Share screen. Want to share the photo instead? Okay, there we go. That's better. My my chat is actually disabled on my end. Uh, so. um, right. Yeah, it's it's set to um kids mode. That's probably why. There we go. Yeah. All right. I I like the Helio Fine. That that is one of my favorite mm -hmm. little mounts. It's it's. It's got one job and one job only, but it does it really, really well. Does it really well? Yep, yep, yep. And uh, yeah, I got this uh, uh, as kind of a gift for myself after my son was born, as a, as around when my son was because I knew that uh, I my astronomy time would go way down, and I would need something to to uh, itch the scratch of needing to do astronomy. So it's like I'll get myself a H alpha scope and a solar quest so that I can set up quickly and I can get going in like four minutes. Uh, it's it's that easy. Um, yeah, I love this thing. I did have a couple people ask me, like, why get the Solar Quest if you have an AZ GTI? Um, and I think that's a really good question. It's just that the AZ GTI, it's great as a general purpose mount. It can go into equatorial mode, which is great. Uh, but Solar Quest, you know, like you said, is for the one job only, and I needed to do it really well, and it does it really well. So for me, it was totally worth it. And I know for a fact that during the eclipse, I don't really even have to practice with this because I, I've used it enough times to know plug it in, turn on, it'll find my find the sun. It's already aligned with this scope here, so I know it'll get it perfectly centered, and I don't have to worry about it. Um, there's no, um, uh, what is it called, uh, the meridian flip that I have to worry about. The only thing I have to do is uh, uh, have to worry about the uh, field rotation if I want to do a time lapse, but that's why I'm using a white light filter and not my uh, LUNT 40 as I was originally planning, and that LUNT 40 is going to go on, let's see, uh, let's go through my pictures. Lunch 40 is here somewhere. Of course, it's not. Um, Lunch 40. One second. There we go. I have to reshare my screen. Stop share, share. There we go. It's my Lunch 40. Uh, it's, it's 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 an amazing scope. Uh, I've been able to do visual with it uh, with the 12 millimeter eyepiece I find that with visual it's like gets the sun perfectly centered and I can see prominences I can see some surface details and it's a single stack uh, I know that I get better details on a dual stack uh, double stack but I think for now this is okay I want to buy a bigger um, H alpha scope later on so I'll just save that money say for 100 millimeters or something in the future. But for now, this is going to be perfect. Uh, and the QHY178 camera that I have gets the full disk of the solar, uh, of the sun. So I don't have to worry about stitching things together. No mosaics, just set and go. Yeah, it's, uh, the stitching solar mosaics is not anything fun. Mm -mm, nope. uh, I, know, I know several people who do, uh, they do really zoomed in views, um, but they're not, um, they don't do the mosaics. It's it's so dynamic that if you... all right, let me describe it this way. <laughs> uh, on my channel, uh, my most popular video is a three hour time lapse of mm -hmm. the sun with a Lunt A uh, hydrogen alpha scope. Right. To do that, I took one minute's worth of exposures and then picked out the best, I think like five or 10% of those images and stacked them and turned it into one frame. The next minute I did the same mm -hmm. over and over and over. And I think I had like about 10, I want to say is between nine and 10 frames a second. So it gives me 600 images per minute that I took. And then I took the best 10%. So let's say five, 10%, so 30 to 60 really, really good images to make one image, mm -hmm. and then the next minute, and the next minute, and the next minute, and the next minute. And this takes a lot of computing power. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're trying to do mosaic, I'm imaging this part of the sun. Let's say I only do it for one minute. Yeah. I'm imaging this, but then I move on to a different part. I image that for a minute. I move on to a different part. I image that for a minute. When you try to stitch those together, there's been changes between. Right. So you're not seeing the sun as it is. 
you're seeing this weird composite of it over several minutes and sometimes the edges don't match up and what's worse um i've had like if you watch that video there are flares which happen very very quickly mm -hmm. and uh if if you try to do this round mosaic of everything and come back to where you were you may miss a flare or right. you may get half a flare mm -hmm. or you may get this weird staggered flare where you're capturing it several different times mm -hmm. uh, lots of stuff that that can happen um so i do the full face yep and yeah. uh, uh i use a 20 megapixel astro camera to do that and for this test there's something else to watch out for uh if you're doing those time lapses i will do it for 30 seconds at a time and then just 30 seconds 30 seconds 30 seconds do post processing each of those 30 second files mm -hmm. is 11 gigs sounds right so I have to write them onto a um, my NVMe drive on my laptop as fast as I can do it. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as I write them, I have to copy them off onto a portable SSD that's bigger that I can actually store the files on, <laughs> actually do something with, because otherwise my laptop is going to fill up within like two hours mm -hmm. no a little bit more than that uh, call it three hours three hours and my laptop is full mm -hmm. um or i keep shuttling the files off onto an external drive this little just a samsung mm -hmm. uh, ssd yep. they're slower and what you don't want to do is write to the ssd because um as soon as you unplug it to put a new one in your whole recording train dies at least yeah. that's what I've noticed with Shark Capture. Yeah. yeah, I've only used Fire Capture. I haven't had to um, swap out drives, but the couple of times I did a solar time lapse, um, yeah, it's, it's really difficult. And I've only done it on my Solar Quest. So along with the you know the, the 11, 12 gig files and having to do like 30 seconds at a time, I, had to, I also had to deal with um, field rotation. Uh, and that's that's hard <laughs> you yes. know because because it's it's all manual uh th there are cer certain ways you can do field rotation corrections with like planets especially with like jupiter and saturn uh wind post will do it for you i've tried it on the sun i've had trouble i wasted days trying to do it on the sun with wind post. so i was like okay i know photoshop i'll just do it manually in photoshop so here's me 100 frames um a hundred i don't know how many frames i had it was like manually zooming in opacity low and correcting them one by one it's uh it was a lot of work and i think out of the five attempts of uh, time lapse i finished one so far uh i i tried to do a seven hour one and <laughs> uh i did it in uh, so what happened with me is um i did it single stacked but i didn't have the edelon tuned properly ah. and so i didn't get that much contrast on the surface just looking i was like this doesn't look anything as good as the last one so uh i i pretty much wasted seven and a half hours uh and just all that data i think it was like almost four terabytes wow and and i couldn't use any of it it was yep. just useless yeah but i did find the trick with photoshop don't try uh, it, it will automatically align you can use auto align to do it don't try to do 500 frames because it, it, it won't like it. No. Uh, but you can do 50 frames at a time and it will line it and it will fix your field rotation. Yeah, no, I, I know about that feature. I've, I've tried it on mine. It did not like the sun. Uh, it would get okay. like, so the, the problem I had was it kept trying to also align on the Z, not the Z axis, the, yeah, the Z axis. So my sun would look weird in some frames. Um, so I did, I did use it for a bunch of like out of like a hundred hundred frames like i it was able to auto align maybe 30 um so then okay. i had to still manually redo the the 70 which is not as bad but it's still you know um yeah so this this time during the eclipse i am using my equatorial mount so i don't have to deal with field rotation uh and the rest of it uh i know i know how i know what i need to do but yeah yeah it's gonna be a lot of files a lot of data Yep. Uh, I, my plan is, um, with the, uh, with the hydrogen alpha to do like, I, I will not be doing any partial phase images. Okay. With in white light, uh, um, it's too much overhead. It's too much of a headache. It's not worth it for me to try to mess with mm -hmm. when I have a really good hydrogen alpha a telescope 
with a good camera that I will be recording everything onto. If I want to, I will make hygiene alpha partial phase images out of the stills from it, out of the process stills. Yeah. And they will look really, really good. And I will be super happy with it. Mm -hmm. uh, and if everything goes well, I'll have a full time lapse. I want to start just a little bit after sunrise and try to go as long as I can until I collapse <laughs> or, or close enough to sunset where I get just too much extinguishing of the light. Um, <laughs> that's, 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 that should be a fun project. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to start two hours before and, and two hours after the eclipse. Um, but I am doing uh, partial with the white light as well as H alpha. And that's absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. for me. I have my partials. I've had partials before. Mm -hmm. I, I just have so much I have to do yeah. uh, with the live stream going on with all the other telescopes, with all the automation. Um, I'm letting it go. Yeah, so, that's fair. Yeah, my what, what I'm focusing on is totality. Uh, I'm, I'm doing Corona. I'm doing Chromosphere. I'm doing the Hydra Alpha for everything. But um, it's Corona and Chromosphere for totality. And that's all. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I I plan on live streaming totality. So I have multiple uh, TV production cameras. I'm trying to figure out how to best attach them to telescopes. I can't attach them to telescopes without a problem. Yeah. That's not the issue. The problem is they're so heavy that it they sag. So the image may not be as clear as I want it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm. I have figured out a way to fix that. I'm waiting on some parts to come in. As soon as they do, uh, I, I think I will be able to fix it. Just give a little bit extra support. Yeah. If I can do that, fantastic. I will have... Uh, I think that this is the first time that anyone will have ever put a cinema camera mm -hmm. on a telescope to film an eclipse. Yeah, that would be cool. Positive. But I haven't seen that before, so um, I've got a bunch of cameras that I borrowed, and uh, I will be using those. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I hope for the best. Yeah, uh, I have uh, um, these are my uh, a lot of the equipment that I have is borrowed. Mm -hmm. um, I have to thank Juan Martinez. Uh, Juan has uh, is a member of our club. He has been incredibly generous with not just his time but his equipment his money he has bought a bunch of the heliofind mounts nice um he has actually uh, uh he's bought them for outreach to um give to various libraries and, and organizations and schools uh, he has bought a bunch of 70, 70 millimeter white light scopes and put and built uh sun funnels for them nice so that uh you know there's there's no risk to, to people damaging their eyes by looking through a telescope. Mm -hmm. They look at a at a projected image of the sun in such a safe way mm -hmm. that, um, you know, un unless they take a knife to the plastic and rip everything off or pull the whole thing off, there's really no risk to their eyes. Uh, it's really super important. Right. Um, he has bought several of these uh, Lunt uh, uh, hydrogen alpha telescopes. This one that I have is his. Um, and it, it, he's he's just absolutely f a fantastic person. That's amazing. So, uh, uh, and then the cameras are my cousin's for his job, and he's letting me use them. Um, everything that he's got is to just take it all <laughs> and, and use use what you can, get what you can. So that's that's what I'm gonna do as much as I can. I've got four of these television cameras. I've got one cinema camera. I have so many lenses. Uh, I. I have too many cameras <laughs> to use, too many astro cameras. I probably will not use all the DSLRs. And um, I have five, six, seven laptops. Yeah, I have seven laptops, one mini computer, and one more mini computer back here that I swear I'm going to get this thing <laughs> up and running before the eclipse and get all the software running on. I have to switch out some parts on the inside. Um, but I should be able to get this thing up and running too, and uh, it, er, er, this is for automation. Everything has got to be automated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you you can't run 
one, two, three, four, five, six minimum. You can't run six telescopes <laughs> and cameras and no. everything else uh, in any way whatsoever as one person. Everything mm. has to be automated. Yeah, so. it, it, it's even difficult to run two things and also enjoy the eclipse yourself manually. Um, that that was me in 2017. I had I had automation set up with um, Eclipse Orchestrator, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. Uh, starting with my uh, my uh, my Celestron power tank, uh, it was just like I'm not giving you power anymore, and it was working. You know the the flashlight was working. It was not working anymore. So I was like, no problem. Run like a get closer to the Airbnb. I can run a plug through the wall, and. I forget what else happened, but like Eclipse Orchestrator was like, uh, no, the time is wrong. It was probably my fault. It's probably user error. I definitely did not spend enough time to practice, which is, I'm not going to make that same mistake this time. So I'm getting a ton of practice. And I started a year ago. Um, so That's when I started my solar outreach, both online and offline. And yeah, I think I'll be ready. So I agree with you that, you know, automation is the way to go. Uh, and I also agree when you said earlier that if it's your first eclipse, try and enjoy it as much as you can. And if you must, must image it, if it's your first eclipse, you know, look into automation. Uh, there are lots of applications out there. I, I put out a video last week for, on Set NC, which is a solar eclipse timer and controller. Super simple. You need like a small Windows computer uh, and you can automate your Canon EOS camera uh, on a telescope. Um, Eclipse Orchestrator also works well. It didn't work for me in 2017, but uh, that's probably my fault. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's just I'm running it on all five of those laptops. It, I had issues with a couple of cameras, actually one of Juan's cameras, we were testing them today, and the uh, the serial shutter wouldn't trigger, but the USB worked fine. Good. And um, it, it, it has a neat little simulation mode, right. so that it'll you, know, you put in where you're going to be, and then you can say simulate that uh, this uh, C2, the contact 2, mm -hmm. and then it will go through, and it's neat because it will tell you 30 seconds till totality, mm -hmm. and then it'll say filters off, mm -hmm. take off your filters. Yep. And then it'll shoot different sequences, whatever you program in. Mm -hmm. Then it'll do your your brackets. Mm -hmm. And we were testing that, and yep. it was working. Yep, yep. So, yep. I have I have all of that working on um, uh, with Set NC this year, and that's the practice I didn't do with um, uh, Eclipse Orchestrator in 2017, because I was like, you know, yeah, technology, you know, it comes to me naturally. I'll figure it out. Uh, no, no, no. No matter how much you know technology, if you, the Eclipse isn't something to. Um, you can't practice on an eclipse. Let's say that it's, they're so rare, um, especially total eclipses. You can't say I'll get the next one. That's although that's kind of what I did in 2017. I was like, yeah, seven years for the next one. I can, I can kind of, I'll, I'll wait a little bit. But yeah, there was a mistake. But I did end up getting a lot of good images because I had backups ready, which is just you know get my camera running with my with an intervalometer, uh, and just let it go, and I got pretty nice pictures with two different setups. I'm, pretty happy with it. You can see the image like right on my wall behind me uh, as one of them or a uh, collage of, from one of those uh, setups. Let's see. Oh, I'm wondering if my uh, um, I think my audio on my stream isn't very good for you, for you but oh mm. well. This is the first <laughs> time we're doing it. Growing pains. Yeah, yeah. It'll be fun. Yeah, we'll figure it so, out for the next one. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll practice. So I think that's what, that's what we didn't do this time. We'll set up a, a private stream. So we, we've talked a little bit about some of the equipment that we're using, some of the mounts, telescopes, special solar telescopes. Uh, we didn't talk so much about filters. No, let's talk um, about filters and safety. Yeah, so um, I noticed someone in the chat said that they're doing a box with pinholes. Absolutely fantastic. Perfect. Camera Obscura, pinhole camera absolutely safe way to do it just don't look through that pinhole at the sun <laughs> everything else is fine yep. uh, use that projection that's the easiest way to do it you can use a colander you can use a um, saltine crackers that's a good use saltines that's a good and with little kids this is absolutely fantastic because you hand out crackers and then you come back again later and you hand out more crackers because they've eaten it the first time <laughs> and and after they're done they can eat them again and and, and that's fine there's no waste um, but you can That's a good idea. You use use the holes on there to you know, project against your hand or against a piece of paper, and you can see the the, the how the sun's shape changes. Yeah. Um, you can do um, uh, the colander; mm -hmm. it'll be the same thing. There's the um, uh, oh, 
leaves on trees. So right. stand underneath a tree, see the sunlight filter through the leaves and everything. You won't see little round suns anymore. You'll see everything's a little crescent, mm -hmm. some shape and size of a different crescent. Yep. As you get closer to totality, it's really neat. Yeah. Um, glasses. You want to talk about glasses? Yeah, let's talk about glasses. Um, so like uh, starting a few months ago, I started going on overdrive, talking to people. And uh, I guess I can say I was basically lecturing people on solar safety. Uh, and it all revolves around this ISO solar safety standard uh, numbered 12312-2, colon 2015. So I've said it this many times that, you know, it just, it's in the, it's, I know that better than my phone number at this point. And the AAS website, the American Astronomical Society website, has all the information anyone could ever need about solar safety products, solar safety glasses. They have a list of suppliers where you can, that they, I think it's over 200 now, where you can go, to make to buy solar eclipse glasses, solar filters, and you can be confident that they're confident that those products have task, passed safety standards or complies with the ISO safety standard. And one of the things that I've started doing, I'm not a, I'm not a huge Facebook user. Uh, I don't do a lot of Facebook, but st starting in January, I, I started using more Facebook. I started joining solar eclipse groups. Uh, because I was like, you know, Facebook is a great way to spread information, but it's also a great way to spread misinformation. So I was like, okay, I'm going to try my best to try and educate as many people as possible on on solar safety. So I started making these videos and I started making posts on these Facebook groups. And it's, it's, uh, it's a hard battle to fight. There is a lot of people that will just say things that have no that, that don't make any sense or they'll link to products that are completely unsafe, that are not verified. I'll do my best to speak out against them. And uh, I'll, I'll give a shout out to one of the Facebook groups that uh, I'm a part of, uh, Solar Eclipse 2024. I'll put the link in the description. And the uh, admins, um, Eric Adams and Gina Kerbo, are the, they've done a really amazing job of making sure that any post there is linking to uh, safe websites or they're talking about the AAS website. That's the only group I've found so far that have actually taken that seriously and are actually enforcing those rules. Um, and I wish more groups did that because now people are posting links to Etsy and Amazon. Some of the Amazon links are fine, but like Etsy and eBay, those are really hard to verify. Like, yeah, sure, it says ISO standard on there, but how are you sure that it's real? You know, like, because counterfeiters can just stamp that number on, it means nothing. Uh, if you don't know where those glasses are sourced, you know, you, you could end up damaging our eyes. Um, and if you're using it on a telescope, you can end up damaging your gear or, you know, give yourself unwanted laser eye surgery if you're using a non-standard uh, filter. But, yeah, still trying, still trying. I post every single day, still making videos. We actually, uh, on our um, on our club uh, e-group, we had someone who uh, got different, uh, different glasses, and one of them, he said that these are not <clears throat> as dark as the rest. And he took, uh, he showed a picture taken through the glasses with his cell phone indoors. So he had a light bulb, uh, just like probably in, a, in the garage or in the workroom, he had light bulb overhead. And then he had a, um, off in the background, he had a fluorescent light. And through the good glasses, you could barely see both lights. Mm -hmm. Through the bad glasses, you could see his like uh, um, cat or work worktop workspace and oh, no. his tools and stuff. You could see everything. It's like no, 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 no. Those aren't good. No. And uh, uh, I would also advise not buying off of Amazon because again, you don't know what you're going to get. Mm -hmm. uh, last time, 2017, um, Amazon refunded everyone's purchases of of glasses, whether they were the paper glasses. Mm -hmm or the hard plastic ones. Um, I actually, it's in the other room. Uh, I bought a ND 100,000 screw on filter for uh, one of my camera lenses. And this is, this advertised specifically as a solar filter. It does a really, really good job. Mm -hmm. And I know this is a legitimate one because I know the Japanese company and this is, this is their thing. This is what they did. And that filter cost me 80 bucks back in 2017. Mm -hmm. Amazon refunded me that as well. Wow. They weren't messing around. Mm -hmm. They were 
it was anything if you bought something that was a solar filter advertised solar filter mm -hmm. we are refunding yeah. all of that because they didn't want to mess with any liability or anything mm -hmm. else it's yeah. like they they said throw them all away mm -hmm. but yeah but this is a good filter i'm not going to throw this one away right right yeah yeah and um uh, the one thing i'll mention about amazon i i agree with you that you should you should not start your search at amazon uh, how about that because i say that because lunt uh, recently moved all of their small uh s small um it's not capacity yeah uh, the small number of glasses onto amazon so you can no longer buy them from the lunt website you have to go through amazon uh, but you should go through their website click the link it says buy on amazon and it'll take you to the product page uh it was a little uh disappointing to see them do that but i understand you know it's uh it's it can be a hassle trying to ship all of them on time i got my lunch classes from them last year through their website um and back then they were also selling uh a 250,000 pack uh, at some point which was which was interesting uh but yeah so that's that's the that's the only one and lunch from uh I've, I've been doing eclipse glasses reviews for the last year and lunch is one of the more popular ones and i think it's because they're using black black polymer and so mm -hmm. they don't have the light scattering around the sun. So if you use a black silver polymer, a lot of people notice uh, when they take images or even when they look through their eyes is that there's some glow around the sun. That's yeah. just some of the light scattering. And I think it's the, it's the silver polymer that reflects and creates those. And well, on the, But the silver polymer on the back, On the right? front. On the front? It does it on there? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's interesting. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you some of the pictures I took. Um, okay. And I've also had people reaching out to me. Uh, about my reviews saying you know like uh, uh, the last last video review I did it was all silver black polymer so they all had that light scattering but the one I did last year Lunt was the only one that was black black polymer and they're still okay. doing black black polymer I bought a couple of pairs a few weeks ago just to make sure that they're still the same you know since they moved it all to Amazon they still look the same to me and I, you know I, I Lunt is a great company. I still trust them. Um, and yeah, there's no glow around the sun, no light scattering. It looks yeah. it looks just fine. It's just just It's just how it's made, I guess. And it's just a little bit yeah. different. Okay. So it, as long as it works fine, as mm -hmm. long as it's up to standards, as long as it yeah. blocks out the right amount of light, that's absolutely fantastic. It does, yeah. So I think the ones we have are typically silver. The ones we've gotten from um, uh, uh, Eclipse yeah. Ambassadors are yeah. silver as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah silver. Yeah, I've got yeah. a bunch of those. Yeah, this is Rainbow um, Symphony. Now, as warnings, uh, I on a, my channel I have a safety video on how to use glasses, how to properly use the glasses, mm -hmm. and um, about halfway in there is a point where I take the glasses and I put them behind the telescope, mm -hmm. not in front. So the filters, the filters always go in the front, unless you have a very 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 special filter which costs a whole lot of money, and that one goes in the back. But for every day, for most people, the filters always go in front. I actually took the glasses and put them at the back of a small telescope. Um, it burned a hole right through the through the filter material in less than I half. I have this demo for you. I, d I did that too. You can see the hole. Yep. And also, incidentally, never take a green laser to those filters either. Mm -hmm. Because a green laser is powerful enough that it will punch pinholes through it. You do that too. I've done I've done that test again. Yeah, not on those glasses, but okay. I've, I've done that test just just to just as a test because I know a, a lot of green lasers are uh, what are they doing like doubling up uh, infrared, so it's just a lot of yeah. heat coming through. Yeah, it's interesting. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So it's you've got to be careful. Those glasses do not protect against lasers. Um, they just don't. Mm -hmm. So uh, I found that out uh, goofing off. <laughs> uh, just testing. Because I have a laser that I use for my polar alignment. And right. yeah. I had the filter in one hand, I had the laser in the other hand. And I mean, we're all monkeys, so we're all curious. Yeah. Turn the laser on, put it there. Oops, I just burned a hole through the filter we just made for a camera lens. <laughs> and so <laughs> open it up, replace the filter material. Close it back up. Yeah, yeah that's, and, that's worse than what I, I I just used glasses just as a test. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I didn't think of using glasses. I had a fil I had the, our newly made filter in one hand and a laser in the other. And, <laughs> and that's it. And you know, we we are primates. We are yeah. curious. Yeah. Lessons and lessons learned. We will do things like that because we want to see. Hey, remember, most scientific discoveries are not people sitting around thinking. 
if I do this, then I will get this. Most discoveries are accidents. Mm -hmm. Most discoveries are very quickly preceded by the words, huh, that's <laughs> weird. And it's people trying stuff. And remember, uh, if you don't write it down, it's goofing off. It's not science. Mm -hmm. So if you discover something, write it down. So we can see exactly what was done, and then we can, other people can replicate it. Mm -hmm. That's what makes science science, mm -hmm. and not just messing around with stuff. Right. So, right. That's my rant. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, right. St start with messing around. You know, you never know what you're gonna find. But be yeah. but be uh, careful. Okay. So where's the eclipse gonna be? Um, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. So I've got. Let's see if I can do this. Uh, so many windows open. Um, so, uh, Xavier Joubier is a, uh, French guy. Mm -hmm. He is, I believe he's French. Um, yeah. he has one of the best, um, eclipse maps for every eclipse yep. anywhere. Yep. So let's see if I can get this. Yeah. And his site is probably, yeah, his site is pretty much hammered right now mm -hmm. um, everyone's hitting his side I'm trying to bring it up right now it's not coming up um, let, me let me see if I can stop and, and reload it maybe it'll come up uh, I don't know Naz do you want to try to bring it up I'm trying to Yeah, I think Let's his side see. is just hammered oh, man we, I, we were just looking at it earlier so where is the best place in Texas? If we're going to be looking at... Um, okay, let me share my uh, screen. Hold on. Okay. I got it. I'm going to cancel my share. Okay, go ahead. Screen share. We'll let you... There you go. Yeah, there you Can go. you see it? Yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, mine just came in a second ago, too? Cool. Right. Fantastic. So, if you can zoom in. Let's look mm -hmm. at Texas. So, well, here's the thing. This is where it's going to be across the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, so it starts off in the middle of the Pacific where there's nobody. Right. It touches no land until it hits Mexico out near Mazatlan. So, and wait, can you zoom out just one moment? Okay, everything between those green lines is going to be able to see a partial mm -hmm. eclipse. Yep. Some portion of the sun is going to get covered up by the moon. Towards the green line, it's going to be very little. Closer to the center point, it'll be a lot or everything mm -hmm. so everyone in north america except for a good except chip for alaska um <laughs> yeah yeah sorry alaska and, yeah oh well they get to see others uh, <laughs> they're they're not gonna be able to see anything um hawaii will see it a little bit right after like yeah the, the sun will rise with the with the the sun partially eclipsed yep and and that's all Mm -hmm. And then it'll be over fairly quickly for them. Yep. Um, then uh, it will land, uh, or the the shadow will make landfall near Mazatlan, mm -hmm. and then cross into Durango. If you want the best chance of clear skies, you want to be in Durango in Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, it's high desert. It's yep. the Chihuahuan Desert. So it's high, it's dry, less likely to be cloudy. That's where you want to be. But it is remote, so there's not a whole lot there, yep. and um, well, so it's it's not easy to get to. Yep. So, barring that, um, the three cities in Texas, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and San Antonio, are where pretty much everyone is going to be looking at. Uh, from our forecasts, um, this is an El Nino year, so mm -hmm. we have a. The jet stream is further to the south and more east-west, so it's crossing across Texas. Um, that's going to keep the clouds, typically for this time of year, further to the north. Mm -hmm. What we're kind of expecting is clear skies between Dallas-Fort Worth all the way down to just past the hill country and before it hits like Eagle Pass, before it hits the Rio Grande Valley. Mm -hmm. The Rio Grande Valley is a lot more humid. It tends to have more clouds, uh, so we expect a little bit more cloudiness there. But between, let's say, Uvalde and Dallas-Fort Worth, we're expecting, hopefully, clearer skies than normal this time of year. Past Dallas, we go into um, 
the Red River Valley, and that is always more humid. East Texas is a lot more humid and, and just generally more wet than mm -hmm. Dallas-Fort Worth and further to the west. Right. So um, we're expecting clouds there. Arkansas, same thing. It's pretty humid. And then uh, from what I was reading a couple days ago, there could be a hole in the clouds in Indiana through Ohio, and then very likely that to be very cloudy past Ohio um, through the Great Lakes area into Vermont and Maine and then into the Maritime provinces in Canada. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, that sounds right. Uh, I will I will say um, so we uh, looked at the uh, clouds in on April 8, 2023. Uh, I am personally hoping it doesn't happen because Texas was under clouds and the Northeast was clear. Um, so to anyone listening, like, you know, like, sure, you know, th this is what we're talking about. It's just something, uh, it's just like historical, historical predictions, I guess I could, if, 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 if I could say that, that that's what we're expecting. It's still too early to say what's going to happen with the clouds. Uh, we are keeping our eyes on, on the weather, but typically three to four days before the eclipse is when we can expect to see something more accurate. Uh, everything before that, anything you hear on the news, anything you hear people on Facebook or Twitter or where, wherever, um, it's not it's not going to be accurate. So so don't get freaked out. Say if you it's see all speculation. Yeah, it's all speculation. Um, we, we we don't know for sure. These are like the long term projections based on you know climatology that you know we, we've already been looking at for years and years. <clears throat> but again, yeah, we don't know, mm -hmm. and we won't know until. A week beforehand. Mm -hmm. Are you going to bed? No. No, not yet? We're going to shower. Okay. So, we're talking about where we're going to be in Texas. Okay? So, we're going to be here at home, right? Uh-huh. And then, we're, we're, we may go to Fredericksburg. So, um, one thing that we were talking about lately is because so many people are coming to Dallas-Fort Worth, to Austin, San Antonio, our whole region, um, We've had discussions with, uh, like, uh, emergency management discussions with various city managers, with emergency managers in Texas. Um, there are several counties that have declared states of emergency right. because there are rural counties and they really don't have the resources. Right. For example, in our area, uh, Dallas Fort Worth, we're expecting what? Did you run over your foot? Yes. It's always a danger. No, no. Um, in Dallas Fort Worth, we're expecting one to two million people wow. coming into the greater Dallas Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. uh, the town of Hillsborough has, I think, like just over 10,000 people. Yeah. And they're expecting 100,000 people in Hillsborough, just south of Fort Worth. Right. Um, in Ennis, just south of Dallas, uh, they're expecting 250,000 people in a town of 22,000. Yikes. Uh, Kerrville has 20-something thousand people down in South Texas in the Hill Country. And Kerrville is a very, very lovely town. Mm -hmm. Kerrville is expecting a half a million people. Yep. So that's something we have to watch out for. Uh, Susan Todger says NASA is going to be at... Louis Hayes, Lu Louise Hayes Park, and Kerrville. They're going to be everywhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. They're sending teams out all over the place. Some people may get clouded out. Some people will have clear skies. Uh, NASA is sending up a, a plane to follow the, the, the track of the eclipse for as long as it can at 50,000 feet. Doing, I think they're doing infrared studies with that one. I'm not 100% positive, mm -hmm. but that's typically what they do. Um, we were near Tarpley for the 2000 or for last year for the annular uh, in a in a rented cabin. Um, where is that? And that was really neat. Uh, you got to zoom way in. Tarpley's a little bitty town. Oh, it's where? Near, it's south of Kerrville. South of Kerrville. Okay, let's see. Yeah, you go in the wrong direction. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it, these towns are really small. Yeah. Um, so, oh man. What, what was this? Yeah. How do you spell it? Probably just search it. T A R, like oh. tarp, L E Y T A R P L Y. There it is. Yeah, Tarpley mm -hmm. there. So, um, yeah, these are really really small towns. Uh, these are two lane 
well, yeah, well, the one lane either direction, uh, roads through most of this place, hills everywhere, all private property, uh, a lot of ranches. Um, there's not really a whole, you would think there's a lot of space to spread out. The problem isn't the space, it's the services. Mm -hmm. So in a town of 20,000 people, they don't have gas for a half million people. Right, yeah. They don't have food for a half million people. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why the costs are so high for a lot of these events is they're having to bring in a lot of food. They're having to cook a lot of food. They're having to probably bring in uh, outside workers just to be able to feed all these people. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not enough hotel rooms. There's not enough Airbnbs. People are renting out rooms. They're renting out houses, um, whatever they can in order to uh, just, you know, make a little, bu a little bit of money on the side, but also just to house all these people coming in. Because otherwise, yep. you're literally going to have people sleeping in cars. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Not ideal. Uh, before we continue, we have a question. Um, it's Rich from Deep Space Astro. He, he has a good one. Uh, what happens during totality with your hydrogen alpha time lapse? Will it pick up anything at all? That's a, that's a good question. During totality? Mm hmm. Uh, it'll pick up prominences. Mm hmm. And, and that's <laughs> it. But the rest of it will be black. Mm hmm. But I don't care. On the hydrogen alpha, I don't care because I will have a bunch of. Uh, of cameras, of white light cameras taking images of the corona and everything else. So my time lapse will be sun, 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 sun's getting covered up, sun disappears, maybe some prominence around the edge, sun reappears, keeps re more and more uncovered, uncovered, then totally uncovered, and then after a little while, the sun sets. So that's my plan for that particular um, uh, uh, time lapse. But the actual totality, that's just going to be white light. There's, there's mm -hmm. not much to see in, um, in hydrogen alpha. Uh, on top of that, in 2017, um, I used a, you know, I don't have it here. Uh, I used a uh, modified uh, Canon T3i, um, an Astro modified Canon T3i. So what that means is um, on DSLRs, mm -hmm. the, the sensors are really, really sensitive to infrared light. They're really sensitive to infrared light. Uh, and if you just leave them as it is, they won't look any good. I mean, it, it, every one of the images that you take with that camera um, that I don't put an infrared blocking filter on it looks like an old picture from like the 1980s. I'm dating myself. Um, <laughs> that you printed out and you put in a shoebox and you left it there for like five or six or 10 or 15, 20 years. And then you open up the shoe box and you pull them all out. And the blue and green pigments have faded, but the red pigment is still there. Mm -hmm. So all the pictures look like that, like old pictures from the 80s that you, you pull out of a shoe box. Um, and so I was using that camera on one of the telescopes to see what I could see in infrared. Mm -mm. I had no good images out of that. <laughs> they were they were all bad, so I'm not gonna make that mistake again. Um, so, so, yeah, it, it's I could not do infrared images with what equipment I had. Was, um, was yours um, um, that fully modded? Did you remove both oh, yeah. of the filters? Okay. Yeah, it's a probably why. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I so I, have, it, I have an H alpha mod uh, Astrocam uh, DSLR, so it's just the does the first infrared filter that's removed so most of my pictures through just do look red but i plan on using that on my wide field setup and the the two ways to get around it is first i'm going to shoot raw so the white balance doesn't mm -hmm. matter i can edit it later but because it's wide field i'm going to shoot raw and large so i'll get jpeg so i can quickly share those um i can do a custom white balance so i have i don't have this on my desk but i have the you know the, the, the white black and uh, gray cards that i can use to set a custom mm -hmm. white balance um, so that's what I'm planning on doing. And just a plug for my future self, I, I will make a video on how I do the custom white balance on my DSLR because I had a couple of people ask me how I'll be using the Astro Modded camera. So I'll, I'll go over that in detail. That's, that's one. I have mine is like tiny. This is, no yeah, I've got a better one. Where's my good one? No, that's not it. Uh, this is. Oh, yeah. 
this is my custom balance tool for nice. scuba diving. Oh, nice. Yeah. That's a good one. So yeah. this is this is actually a blue color. It's not a white color. Yeah. Okay. This, and then this, great. this because yeah, the, uh, and and I, I've got these as well for for regular imaging mm -hmm. and regular video. Um, but the advantage of using something like this underwater yep. is this is now my standard. Yeah. So I can then um, I can then take an image in regular white light. And then I can color balance my underwater images. Yep. But this is what we can use. Yep. This is exactly what we would use with these modified cameras. We get this. This is what it should look like. So modify your image so it looks like this. And there are automated tools that do it too. So it's not like you have to do it manually anymore like you used to. Yeah. All right. Wait, wait, I have up, a question. message. Um, actually, I have a message from Juan. And he said, uh, make a plea reminder, folks. Take pictures. Take people pics. Yes. So, yeah. Here's... <laughs> For for everyone who's okay, you can buy the little kits that have the little bitty tiny filters that you put over your cell phone, like right. like a little bit. Sometimes they have like Velcro or sticky tape or something like double sided mm -hmm. tape. You can put it over your cell phone. You can take pictures of the eclipse with your cell phone. Yeah, just taking pictures. Yeah, yeah, this is great, fantastic. <laughs> no. These are super tiny sensors. Yep. Okay, the chips on your cell phone. They're very, very, very small. The the sensors on my cameras, like back here, I have a I have a one full frame and then I have the cinema camera. Yeah, there we go. Full frame DSLR cinema camera. This is a full frame chip, so it's 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 big, and this one is a super thirty five. So not as big as a full frame, still fairly large. Bigger the chip, the more light it gathers. The more light it gathers, the better the details. Mm -hmm. If you take, even with like a super zoom, whatever whatever you think is a super zoom on your camera, on your cell phone camera, and you try to take a picture of the eclipse, it's not going to look that great. Take it, go ahead, just take one for yourself just to see if you absolutely have to. Mm -hmm. Instead, take pictures of family, take pictures of friends, take people of, of who you're with. If you want to take a video, the coolest video you can take isn't a video of the eclipse. Mm -hmm. It's just gonna look bad. Okay? <laughs> I mean, fingers crossed, it's gonna look bad com compared to what I hope to be able to make. Okay. Instead, take a selfie of yourself. Take a selfie video of yourself, like enjoying totality. Take a video of friends and family. Take photos of of friends and family during totality. Take. Um, Right before totality, when the light gets really weird, yeah. take pictures of that. Take pictures of the crescent shining through uh, tree leaves um, or from your colander or something else. Mm -hmm. uh, something that's really, really cool. Really, really cool. But it's hard to video. It's hard to take a picture of. Um, take a big white sheet and lay it out on the ground. Okay? That's all you got to do. Lay a big white sheet on the ground. And right before totality, like a minute or two minutes before totality, um, there are things called shadow bands. And again, they're really, really hard to video because uh, they're super subtle, but you can see them with your eyes. And it will look like these, like waves rippling across the white sheet. And what it is, it's the light passing through this narrow slit of light from the sun is passing through the atmosphere and just the the waviness of the atmosphere just the air currents mm -hmm. are making it move making the light kind of of, of uh, refract a little bit and it creates these uh, we just call them um, shadow bands mm -hmm. and they're really really cool to see across a white sheet of paper yeah. or not, uh, sorry a big white sheet it, they're they're big enough that you can see them on a on a big um, like a you know a king or a queen queen sized white bed sheet on the ground, but on a piece of paper you're probably not gonna be able to notice it very mm -hmm. well. Um, but on something that size, you can you can actually see it's. And again, it's only in the about two minutes, three minutes or so before totality, and then directly after. So I'm going to try to aim a camera at one. I don't know if we'll be able to see it, and I may have just. Say ah, enough of this, and swing the camera back over to to totality. Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's something else to watch out for. That's something really cool that you can do uh, with with kids. Uh, just you know, put put rocks 
on on the corners so it doesn't get blown away if there's any wind like you were saying there's the wind that follows totality mm -hmm. you know you, you don't you don't want totality to be over and then have to tr try to cover up cameras or make mm -hmm. sure that the kids put their glasses back on while chasing your bed sheets down the street <laughs> over into yeah. the neighbors over the fence into the neighbor's yard yeah Sh uh, shadow bands are something i wanted to try for but uh i decided against it because i don't have enough cameras i would rather use all of my cameras pointing up um, and if anyone wants to learn more about shadow bands uh, aside from googling it I, I do recommend um, Gordon Telepin's book um, he has a book on uh, total eclipses and he has like a chapter on shadow bands he loves shadow bands he's done so many videos on shadow bands uh, he's talked to me about shadow bands it's, it's really interesting uh, I've never seen it I've known about him since 2017 uh, but it's something I'd like to see one day, uh, and and hopefully I'll get another chance when I go to Egypt in 2027. Uh, uh, we're not playing that far out yet. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm focused just on this, nothing else, just on this. And my wife has said if uh, uh, that she doesn't want to hear the word telescope for a while after <laughs> April 8th. Uh, That's fair. Again, like you saw the picture earlier of the. Um, um, the uh, uh, all of the telescopes out in my front room. Um, my front room and my dining room have been taken over by cameras and telescopes for the last several months. Yeah. Uh, my wife is tired of it. Uh, the you can barely get inside the house in the entryway because <laughs> there are cases everywhere. I have uh, I've been packing away. I've been labeling everything so everything has its place. But honestly, it's taking up a lot of room. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, my parents will come over and they will they will complain <laughs> that there's uh, too uh, much stuff here. And I know the feeling. I have my, I have an office basement um, and I have to walk around. No one else is allowed down here. Um, uh, they can come, but they'll they'll have trouble walking around. Um, yeah, that's my office too. It's a, <laughs> it's a minefield. My my kid has taken over one of the rooms upstairs as his Lego room. So there are Legos everywhere on the floor. It's like walking through a minefield. You never know when you're going to step on something. And my office is kind of turned into the same thing. So uh, I do uh, look forward to cleaning up my office and actually getting it to a usable place again mm -hmm. because it, it's not at that place yeah. right now. Soon enough, though. Yeah. Okay. We have, um, we have one more question yeah. from Rich. Okay. Um, so do you guys recommend using an UV IR cut filter with a white light filter or astronomy camera? Any benefits to yes. using one? Yes, always, 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 always. There you go. Yep. So um, the UV filter uh, clears out a lot of haze. Mm -hmm. um, so atmospheric haze, it gets rid of that in your images. Uh, and then the UV, or sorry, the IR part will clear out uh, any IR blooming. So um, do I have it on here? Yes, I do. <laughs> what a coincidence always prepared yeah let's see can you see that uh, mm -hmm. there we go that nice red um, this is a UV IR cutout filter and I actually did testing with this exact lens so this is the normal lens and you can see if I mm -hmm. hold it up to the light let's see if I can get it wait, 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 that was over here yeah you, oh, here we go that's the right direction up okay there's no filter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't look red. Mm -hmm. it's just a reflection back of the, the overhead light. There we go. And the filter yep. is red. Okay, there we go. Nice and red. So, yeah, flaring this back at the camera. Let's see. There you go. Ah, there we go. Now I can do that. Let's see, do SOS. So, um, I did images out um, at night in um, down in Tarpley for the 2017 eclipse. And uh, I thought, well, I, I don't need the filter. Um, it's nighttime. So I took images, uh, wide field images. This is a, uh, a Canon 50 millimeter. Um, this is the 1.4. Yeah, 1.4. Same one? Uh, uh, this is 1.8, so you got you have the better one. Yeah. Yeah, you got the pancake. I got the so, pancake, yeah. Yeah. Nifty um, Nifty. I, I, I use it for portraits as well because I like the 1.4. Mm -hmm. um, and I have an 85 1.8 too, and, and I love that one. That's my favorite port portrait one. So anyway, um, that one also takes really good astro images. It's mm -hmm. nice and okay. sharp. Yeah. The problem is you get bloom off of stars. So 
all the pictures that I took of of the um, of the stars, just the stars, without the filter, it was this red kind of fringe to everything, to all the stars, to, well, to the really super bright ones. And I was looking, I was like, what is going on here? This looks horrible. I don't remember this lens being this bad. Is my focus off? Is this, I I put a little a Batnov mask on there so I could get a really good focus, mm -hmm. test it. No, no, it's not that. I thought, oh wait, I just took that filter off. Okay, let's put it back on. As soon as I did all that. <laughs> So the images came out far, far better. Um, I have some really decent uh, Milky Way shots from there. <laughs> and the only difference is one had a filter, one didn't. So yes, use an IR. If, if Use an IR and UV cutoff if you can have one of those. If not, just get the IR cutoff. And, yeah. and that will improve all of your images. Um, the follow-up question is, so uh, that applies to astronomy cameras as well. Uh, yes. Yes, but most astronomy cameras already have. They, yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, they mostly do have an infrared blocking window. If not, they have an anti-reflection window. Mm -hmm. And with astronomy cameras, it's also a little bit different because um, the the light that you want from hydrogen alpha, from uh, sulfur 2, it's a deep red color. It's really close to infrared. So... If you have an infrared blocking filter that isn't properly tuned and it's blocking those red colors or part of those red colors, um, you're not going to be able to see those nebula very well in your images. So for astro cameras, they're pretty good as they are. You don't really need a, an IR blocking filter for most of those. Um, and what you want is, um, if you're using a light pollution filter, uh, for example, like a, a if you're using an narrow band, that's totally different. But if you're using a wide band, uh, 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 light pollution filter that blocks all light except for the reds of hydrogen alpha, sulfur two, and oxygen three, nitrogen two, um, those will block infrared and ultraviolet already. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to worry about. It. You don't need to double stack filters. You can it sometimes can help but hmm. it's um yeah you can double stack but remember this the filters don't let all of that light through at those frequencies and kill all the light mm -hmm. uh, from other frequencies they typically like the band passes they'll let 90 93 95 percent of that light through and then they'll let close to zero of the other of the light that you don't want the, the frequencies you don't want so if you double stack identical filters then you're going 90 of 90 percent so it's going to be a lot less than that and then um and then you're dropping down more D does that apply to does that apply to the eclipse as well that's the follow -up. i think i think he's only asking about uh, um uh the UVIR cut filter for an astrocam for the eclipse. Um, I I'm not using one. I don't think you need one. Yeah. And w we tested that during the annular, and I had a um, I was using a Herschel filter or a Herschel wedge, and I did not need a um, an IR blocker on there. I had an ND neutral density filter uh and this is one scope again so he put on a neutral density filter and a yellow filter to give it some color to make it pretty um with the herschel lens when i was doing it with the uh, glass thousand oaks filter on the front of the scopes i did not use an ir either that was enough to block infrared as well as general light okay hmm. So, um, I think, I hope yeah, you, you don't, you should not have to need an IR filter for, uh, for any of this, unless you're using a DSLR and a camera lens. All right. Cool. I'll be using the astro cam for the eclipse is what I meant. Yeah. I plan on doing that as well. I just, I actually have a nice little chart, which I made. Where I'm trying to figure out, okay, I've got these cameras, and I have these telescopes and these various lenses, and 
how do I match them up for the best impact? And what I did is, uh, let's see, I gotta bring it up now. So um, I use Starry Night Pro for my, um, for my telescope control, for my imaging planning sessions, mm -hmm. things like that. So uh, I actually have this running on my laptop. So if I, um, I can actually look at, at the application and decide, oh, well, this object is coming up over the western horizon, so it is a good time to go ahead and image that. Um, or, or and specifically, then it's connected to my telescope mount, and then all I have to do is, um, oops, wrong date, is once I have everything aligned, once I have it connected, I just say, ooh, uh, uh, align to, or, or sorry, slew to this object, or, um, and then it'll get close, and then I use my I use SharpCap Pro to do a plate solve. So it takes an image of the stars, and compares to a database, and then goes, oh, okay, I know what you're pointed at now. And then it will automatically resync my mount to whatever my telescope is looking at. And it's such a time saver that I finally figured out how to do that properly, because <laughs> I just have to do it once. Yep. And then I am good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I am going to... Ah, here we go. One, three, four, two. There we go. So I will pause that. Let me do a screen share on my side. And I've got... There. Can you see that? Yep. How's that look? Yep, I can see it. Okay. So, yeah. That is... Well, I can't see it on my side. Well, that's not good. Okay, here we go. We'll just do it this way. Uh-oh. That's not good. i got to stop the share. I have to move this over to this screen. Move that over to this screen. I have so many windows. <laughs> but that's okay. Totally okay. Let's do screen share again to here. There we go. Okay. So, here's what we're looking at. And this is the eclipse. This is April. So, my timing is going to be... It starts at 139. 139 and something. Mm -hmm. Oops. And then it's over with by 143, essentially. So I'll do 142. And I've paused it here. So I'll be looking at it. And then I can do this. And let's zoom in. So remember, this is simulation. This mm -hmm. isn't exactly what it'll look like. But hopefully, something like this. So here's what I did. Because I need to figure out exactly what I'll be looking at. I have a but. Oops. Well, that's not right. I have a bunch of different telescopes. Oh, come on. <clears throat> come on. There we go. Okay. I didn't want to do that. Let's do center. So that locks it in. And I do my field of view indicators. And I can zoom out. And I can say, all right, if I have this telescope and this camera, what is my field of view going to be looking like? Mm -hmm. So if I take, let's see, now here we go. So I want to take the uh, 80 millimeter refractor. It's an F7. And I'm going to put the uh, studio camera on there. This is the field of view I will be expecting. Mm -hmm. okay, which is really, really good at 4K. Yeah. This should be, be really, really nice. Yeah. I won't get the whole corona, mm -hmm. which is fine, because I'm not aiming for the whole corona with this thing. So I want to be able to get the, the prominences. I want to get the chromosphere. I want to get Bailey's beads and, and, um, and diamond ring. This is what I want to see. I'll be super happy if I get this. If I put the C11, the 11 inch, and a cinema camera on, even with the F's, uh, the, the 0.7 reducer, this is my entire field of view. That is not ideal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if I want to do, oh, here we go, the Edge HD. If I put my full frame camera on there and just take images, this is all I'll see. So these are things I have to look at. If I use my uh, APS-C um, with my Teleview, this is what I'll see, mm -hmm. which looks, this looks exactly like what it did in 2017 when I used this camera with this telescope, okay? And I also learned an important lesson. 
if you use glass filters, it changes your focus just slightly. Yep. Just slightly. Mm -hmm. So if your automation says filters off, you take off your filter, you just got to go back and you've got to refocus just a tiny bit. It's just like just one or two millimeters is all you need, but that's not also enough for it to be out of focus. Just a tad. Right. So I learned my lesson. I know what to do this time. When I take off my filters, I will have to refocus a couple of things. I We have four minutes, 10 seconds of totality. I can afford to spend 30 seconds, even maybe 45 up to a minute, going through all my equipment and making sure my focus is good. And then spend the rest of three minutes looking at it, spending time with my family, and <laughs> just enjoying the experience. Yep. Yep. And then as soon as totality is over, rush around and either put <laughs> black trash bags on everything uh, or cover up with as many filters as I can, just whatever I can do to keep the sun from, from hitting equipment. Yep. So my plan is where I put it. I have, a, I have a 16 millimeter. If I was, no, wait, that's not what I wanted. I wanted 25 millimeter in the EOS R. So my plan was this. This is going to be my wide field view. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is Pleiades is right over here. It's going to be outside my field of view. So what I will try to do is off-center the eclipse slightly so I have Saturn and Mars over here. Mm -hmm. Probably won't see Neptune. It's pretty dim. Mm -hmm. You need a, a really good long exposure to see that. Yep. And I'm not going to worry about it. But Venus will be pretty bright. Uh, magnitude, almost magnitude 4. Yeah, minus that's 4. Be, that's, that's pretty bright, bright. yeah. Mercury will not be very bright. I think Mercury, we're not, we're seeing it on this side of the sun, on our side of the sun, not the far side. If it was the far side, it'd be a lot brighter. Yeah. And, but we will have Jupiter and it will be pretty bright and Uranus will not be bright at all. Nope. But we will have Pons Brooks. So that will be a magnitude. I can bring it up here. 4.7. 4. Yeah. So it will be about the same magnitude as Mercury but it's a more diffuse object. Yep. So yep. I will spend some time with longer exposures here just to see if I can bring out um, the comet near Jupiter. If I can, fantastic. If I can't, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. um, but that, that's all we can do. We, we just hope for the best and we, we plan for what we want if we can and if we get it, fantastic. If we don't, then we just don't. Yeah, I've, so I've been that? I've been seeing a lot of articles come out about uh, Pons Brooks and a lot of people commenting, "Hey, we're going to try this." I think my advice to people who are imaging, especially if it's for the first time, don't try to aim for the comet. It's it's not easy imaging a comet as is, uh, and trying to get it during an eclipse, you will end up frustrating yourself. So that's just my advice. I am. I'm I'm like you like I'm hoping if it comes up in my images great if it doesn't I don't really care uh, the comet is like not even on my priorities list uh, on my wide field I'm just trying to get the planets I remember seeing Jupiter and Venus in 2017 uh, along with a couple of stars which was pretty amazing and that's what I want to catch in wide field I did not have a wide field set up in 2017 and I wish I had and this year I will um, so my goal is to just get that so don't aim for the comet the comet will come back around it's coming around and it'll be visible at night it's actually mm -hmm. visible at night now right like pe yes. people can people can image it so try and take pictures of that at night and not during the eclipse unfortunately uh we're we've been having rain lately in north yeah. texas and it cleared up just a little bit this afternoon after the morning rain and now it clouded up again yeah. <laughs> so we're still expecting more rain oh, here too. and rain in the forecast. So unfortunately, it's rather warm really early this time of year uh, than it should be. Um, and uh, the blue bonnets have been already um, uh, flowering on uh, hillsides for the last couple of weeks. So we went out yesterday and alongside almost every highway, we have blue bonnets. So when you come down, mm -hmm. you will see them. You probably don't have them up uh, up there in the northeast nope. near Boston. We do not. So they are a very beautiful flower. They are very pretty. Them, yeah. They blanket the countryside in places, uh, but they are the state flower of Texas, so please don't pick them. Um, <laughs> enjoy them. Take pictures of them. Just don't pick them. They're also very delicate. Mm -hmm. They 
don't really survive if he has picked flowers at all. Yeah. Uh, and for every flower that you pick, um, the seeds don't get seeded for next year. So these are, I don't I think they're annual or annu, mm-hmm. annu, Annual, an, 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 annuals, yeah. annuals. annuals. <laughs> yeah. So they they only grow for the season. They shed their seeds. The seeds go into the ground, and that's what next year's blue bonds come from. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Right. I'm I'm looking forward to uh, seeing them. So yeah, I've. <laughs> uh, it's stuff like this. Th- this is the planning. So one of my plans was a 300 millimeter and the full frame, mm-hmm. but you know, everything will be pretty small in the Corona. Okay. Yeah, and also this year we don't really have any bright stars here. Mm-hmm. Last time we had Regulus off yeah, to the side. Right. I remember that. Yeah, we, we could yeah. align it to Regulus. This year we don't really have much, so it's going to be harder to do stuff like the Eclipse Mega movie mm-hmm. with the alignment. Yep. Um, but I'm, I'm looking forward to whatever I can do. Oh, that might not be too bad. Same here. Eight hundred millimeter, eight hundred and the T three I just to eighty millimeter. Sorry, this is my eighty millimeter scope, just to get a tighter tighter image on it mm-hmm. yeah that should be good yeah we'll see that's all it, we can is, do uh, is starry night free i think they have a free version, free version. mine is not the free version okay yeah yeah so yeah. I, I i just wanted to uh, just just bring up that anyone wanting to do uh looking for a free software like I, if starry night has a free version that's great uh, but i use um stellarium for my planning uh, and you can do s- similar setups there where you can um put in your telescope, your cameras, and get field of view, so you can do planning there as well. Uh, Starting out looks to be a lot more, uh, you, you have a lot more control over some of these things, um, but Stellarium is, is actually really good. I've been using it for... St- Stellarium is absolutely now. fantastic. Mm-hmm. Th- this is just, uh, w- with this thing, this lets me do like full control, so I can come in, up, um, yeah, PM. So you can see mm-hmm. like exactly when it starts, when it ends, yep. for wherever we are, so... Mine's coming out of Fort Worth because, well, that's home. So when the sun goes down, now all of a sudden I can see everything. Yep. It has satellites on here as well, so you can see yep. Starlink absolutely everywhere. Um, old Atlas boosters, mm-hmm. comets that are super far away and super dim, um, stars, galaxies, everything. Yep. Uh, yeah, so this is, what is that, one of stars? This is, isn't this Rosette? I think it looks like Rosette. Rosette, yeah. Yeah. Yep, there it is, so, Rosette Complex. Yep, yep, yeah, here's Orion. Yep. So Very Orion good. will be setting, and then what I want to do is, yeah, here's Uranus, so where is, well, let's see, that's nine, so maybe eight, yeah, here's the comet, so, mm-hmm. uh, oh, geez, eight o'clock, 8.42, Right after sunset, if I yeah. can look far out to the west, I'd be able to see the comet with Jupiter. So if I switch out my cameras, mm-hmm. no, no, that won't do it. <laughs> okay, let's see, what else? 101 in the, oh, well, oh, I'll eh, we'll see. It depends, but we don't know how long the tail the t- is. Yeah, what I'm trying to do is get long, yeah. Jupiter. So what if I do, yeah, 16 millimeters is going to be too big. This will be a, like, yeah, this will be like this, a, a, panorama with a 16 millimeter if i do it that way yeah i have a whole bunch of stuff that i don't really want to get a little bitty comet and then a bunch of other yep. stuff so yeah 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 still yeah, still is... better to aim for it at night for for people who are uh, looking to image the eclipse for the first time yep so what else we have i'm gonna stop that yeah um, this. don't go on uh, private land we have uh, like the, some of the problems yes. and issues. Oh yes. So, <laughs> uh, in Texas, ninety-five percent of the land is privately owned. Um, it's ranch land. It's farmland. Uh, it's just private property. So, one of the problems is you may not, if, like for visitors coming into Texas, you may not know what's private land and what's public land um, because it's not always marked. Mm-hmm. Um, always assume you're going on private land. Uh, there's there's actually one place I know of. It's actually in the hill country. It's north of Fredericksburg, and you you cross onto a dirt road, and it is a public road, but you go across cattle guards, and you think, okay, am I private or am I public? And you don't know, 
and you keep driving and you go across another cattle guard and there are cows on either side of you and there's no fence. So you're thinking, okay, is this private or is this public? <laughs> the road itself is public, land on either side is private. But there's no fences, There's there's and there's a dirt road that you're driving on. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but it is public, so you just don't know. Um, my advice would be assume that if you're on the on a paved road um, that has signs on it, that is a public uh, right of way. If you're crossing a cattle guard, you're probably on private land. Um, if you see a fence, if you're crossing across a fence and there's a gate there, you're definitely on private land. Um, some people may be good about it. Some people may not be good about it. I would just advise stay on public land. Uh, stay with the public events. If you're trying to find a place um, and just pulling off to the side of the road, um, that can be dangerous as well. One of the problems we have here is we have high grass on the side of the road. Uh, the hill country is rather dry and your catalytic converter on the bottom of your car gets rather hot. So if you pull over to the side of the road and there's tall grass there, you can start a grass fire. So that is something else to worry about. Um, find a place to park, uh, find parking lots, find actual places for your car to park and not just pull over to the side of the road. Um, if you absolutely have to, then you have to um, just be aware of the dangers. Uh, if you're coming from the Northeast, uh, you're probably not used to rattlesnakes. Uh, nope. They're not everywhere, <laughs> and they will give you the warning. If you hear a rattle, stop, back up. Okay, You may not even see the thing. Uh, they are very well camouflaged, but you probably won't encounter them. Uh, scorpions are fine. Bark scorpions are fine. Um, if they sting you, it'll hurt. It won't kill you. Um <laughs> It just hurts. That's the, that's it. Um, that's good. What to else know. we got? Uh, scorpions also glow in the dark, so right, if yeah. you have a UV light, you can easily find them at night. Cool. Um, uh, what else? What else? What else do we have in Texas? Um, I do have a UV light oh, now. I have a reason to bring it. Um, something really important. Uh, if you're if you're going to be down the hill country, you will be out in the country. Okay. This is a land of mostly ranches and some farms. It is wild. So if you happen to be out there, mm -hmm. um, something though. Okay, this is something that city folk don't think about very much. <laughs> um, see, in the city, the night sounds are cars, maybe a train, but it's fairly quiet in the city at night. <clears throat> out in the country, there's all sorts of animals. You hear the deer, you hear something big rustling through the underbrush and it sounds big and it's coming toward you and you don't know what it is you think it's some big animal that's dragging their hooves or paws you think it's a bear coming it's not it's an armadillo <laughs> an armadillo doesn't want to hurt you so that's that's an important right there um there aren't really any bears in the hill country to speak of you don't have to worry about those deer are everywhere I would say the only thing to worry about is, especially at night, if you're there, uh, if you hear sounds, everything is fine. When everything gets really, really quiet, when the birds at night stop singing, when the crickets stop chirping, when it gets dead silent, mm -hmm. that's when you get to worry. What's happening? Probably means, no, it probably means that, that there's a person around. Ah. Yes. So for farmers... When you hear the cows, you hear the animals, cows mooing at night, you hear animals all the time. Mm -hmm. That's not a problem. That's not what wakes them up. Dead silence is what wakes up people out in the country. Interesting. Because that means that someone's someone's walking around. But most people have dogs, too, and the dogs are loud at night, too. Yeah. So if uh, if you come on the land, expect to hear dogs. Okay. Interesting, yeah. Most everyone's got a dog. We have a dog. We're used to it. You going to take him? No, no. Oh. no she's uh, for four days in the minivan. <laughs> No, she also doesn't like cars, so that that's not gonna be helpful. <laughs> okay. Um, what else? Okay, last thing. If you if you are here in Texas and you do live, um, you are gonna be in the path of totality already. Your house is there. Stay home. Mm -hmm. Okay. There're gonna be lots of public events. Uh, Fort Worth is having a bunch of public events. Every one of these towns, 
some of them are well not everyone but a lot of them are trying to do public events in in parks a lot of them are paid um maybe they have glasses out there or souvenirs or something everyone's trying to make a little bit of money off of visitors that's not what i have a problem with <clears throat> it's just that we have so many visitors that if you're at home already enjoy the time with friends and family just spend it with with the people you love just mm -hmm. go meet up at at someone's big house stay out outside um wear sunscreen wear a hat wear sunglasses um long sleeves you're going to be out in the sun for a while i have a safety video on our site uh that tells you know what to do what not to do <clears throat> if you want to visit that um and just be with friends and family take pictures of of friends and family uh, take video of yourself having a good time because that's the stuff you're going to remember um, you're not going to look back at the the cruddy little eclipse picture that you took with your cell phone <laughs> it's like oh yeah that picture i took during the eclipse but you're probably not going to zoom in on it and take a really close look it'll just be in your timeline so take one picture for your timeline and, and leave it at that mm -hmm. the rest of them the best pictures that i have from 2017 are not pictures I took with um, through the telescope of the eclipse. It's pictures of my kid when he was a year and a half. It's pictures of my wife That's nice. with with our kid showing him um, uh, showing him the eclipse. And actually, I added those to the safety video, so um, you'll see them towards the end. And those are the best pictures that I have, and they're the ones I printed out and put on the wall. I have one picture of the eclipse, but I have lots of pictures of them because you know, that's what's important to me. It's not, the eclipse is fantastic. I love the mm -hmm. eclipse. I love eclipses. They're absolutely, they're gorgeous. They're totally unique and they're fun to share. Especially fun to share with a lot of people. But my memories are about being with other people. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily of just the eclipse because it goes by so fast. Yep. Two and a half minutes went like that. It was mm -hmm. like, oh, it, it's over with. <laughs> and my kid wasn't crying until it was over with. <laughs> and it was done. That's when it, and when you go, oh, and, and then she's just looking around. I was like, oh, and now he starts crying. But until then, no, he was fine. He was absolutely fine. And so, um, yeah, to, that, 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 that's all I'm going to say. Yeah. I, I would just urge people, enjoy it, watch it, but the time before and a little bit during and then right after, spend it with, with family and friends and, yeah. and just have a good time. Uh, to add to that, my uh, my first total eclipse, I was six years old, and I will tell you, I don't remember the eclipse itself, but I remember my parents and the people around us cheering and and clapping, and I can hear it. Like, if I think about it, I can hear them still, and I can kind of see them, you know, like celebrating. And if I try to picture totality, I can't uh, in my mind, but I know I was there. I remember the sky getting dark, and that's all uh, as a six-year-old. Um, so, yeah, no, totally, like, make time for your make time for friends and family who are around you and enjoy it with them um and when i was six we didn't have cameras so no taking pictures of the sky or us <laughs> but yeah but now fun. we have the we, we have those kinds of things and it's and it's super easy just to pull out your phone yeah and you know you're in the middle of it just take a couple pictures just yeah. take a picture of the sky mm -hmm. uh, one, one of the things to look out for uh deep space astros asking uh, what else do we look out for? Um, 360 degree sunset. The closer you are to the center line, mm -hmm. then the sky overhead, the as the the umbra of the of the shed, the, the shadow of the umbra comes over you, the sky gets dark all around you. Mm -hmm. But when you're looking out at the horizon, you're looking as far out as you can, and maybe more than 100 miles out, and the sky there isn't being covered over, mm -hmm. so it is reddish because the, the light has to travel back a ways to get to you. So that light's gonna be reddish. And all around where you look, it looks like the sun is setting, but it's not. Mm -hmm. you, when you look up, it's a, it's a hole in the sky. It, it is, yeah, it's, it it's is absolutely the coolest <laughs> astronomical phenomenon that you can see in your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah. Again, I would urge you, if you can get to the center line, do so, do it safely. Um, do not, absolutely do not get up on Monday morning at <laughs> 9 a.m. and go, you know what? The line's only three hours away. I 
Ben, if we get in the car right now, we can make it. You're not going to make it. <laughs> uh, we were talking earlier about people. how much, uh, how many people are coming in, like a half a million people in Kerrville, one to two million dollars Fort Worth. I don't remember how many are, are going to be in San Antonio. Probably not in San Antonio. They'll stage out of San Antonio and hit the hill country. Um, but the emergency managers in our area were expecting uh, four hour delays in traffic. Eesh. Yes. That should so, be fun. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a drive that would normally take you like from Dallas to Fort Worth, um, like that would normally take you about an hour, they are expecting basically standstill. Uh, as people, uh, especially closer to totality, because people are, they're just trying to find a place to park. I just need to find a place to park. Mm -hmm. And even if they pull pull over to the side of the highway, it's a place to park. And then everyone wants to get out of the car and look up. And I would highly advise, do not do that. Do not pull over to the side of the highway and get out to look at the eclipse. Mm -hmm. If you have to, get off on the service road, find a find a Walmart parking lot, find a a fast food restaurant parking lot and just park there where where you should be able to park and, and get your views in. And what we're expecting also is right after totality, everyone tries to go home. It's yep. like, okay, totality's over, the show's over. Well, the show is over, totality's over, but the eclipse continues on for another hour, 40 minutes? It sounds uh, right, yeah. Hour 20, uh, hour something. It, yeah. It's an hour, uh, let's call it hour 20 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so... It will continue. Um, the sun will get brighter and brighter and brighter. Uh, I plan to be there until the end. Uh, and then wait until traffic dies down before I drive home. My house is only half an hour away. Mm -hmm. But, um, Still. yeah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to wait quite a while until traffic dies down. And we pack up everything, and then we'll slowly make our way home. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, well, hopefully we won't have to go anywhere. and We can just stay at our Airbnb. For four days, and I'll go, not leave, have to leave. Um, one one thing I'll add to um, Deep Space Astro's question on what to expect is um, just the shadows themselves. I think once you get to like 80 percent, eighty five percent obscurity, um, shadows start to get fuzzy uh, depending on which way you're looking at them. And I think it has to do with the, the polarization of the lights that you were talking about. So I think light that's uh, parallel to the sunlight is going to look sharp. Um, and perpendicular is going to look blurry, or the other way around. One of those, one of those two. But I remember that from 2017. I wasn't looking for it, but then I saw my shadow on the ground, and I'm like, I must be dehydrated. I was dehydrated, but I was like, I must be dehydrated. I'm, I'm seeing weird shadows, but it's a thing. There's a, um, I saw something on Reddit on, I think it was the the Solar Eclipse subreddit today, and someone built a or designed a 3D printed little card. And it has slots on it of different sizes and different orientations. Uh -huh. And you would hold that up to the sun, have the light shining through it onto a piece of paper or something. And then you can see in which direction are the shadows sharp and which direction are they fuzzy. So my 3D printer's on the fritz. It has been for the last two years. And the <laughs> last year while I've been planning this, I have had no time to fix it. Uh, I will do so eventually. Uh, after sometime after everything right now is after April. Definitely, everything is after April. Yep, yep. Yeah. Same here. I have to mow the lawn. It's after April. <laughs> yeah. Clean the pool. It's after April. Um, actually, no. I have to mow the lawn and clean the pool soon too. Um, I have. Um, I don't want to mention it right now, but I, I have uh, someone coming over and um, the week before, and uh, I need to make sure the house is as clean as it can be uh and that includes the yard as well so right, right. um yeah right I, I hope i hope that that goes well i won't mention it either uh so good luck and thank you <laughs> and uh we just passed Cheers. our two hour mark of, of the of the stream oh wow thanks yes, to everyone who watched um so uh you okay with opening up for q a if we still have people watching yeah, yeah. looks like there's 10 anyone people any still questions watching. go ahead and put them in the chat and why yeah. is it the best we can <clears throat> yep any more questions let us know Thank, See, thanks uh, to all the questions Susan so Todd far. Todd said that she's going to be sleeping in the car. I will tell you this: um, uh, for our site down in in south of Fort Worth, I'm not going to mention exactly where it is. Uh, this will be open to uh, our club members from the Fort Worth Astronomical Society, and I have mentioned that to them 
many times over the past uh, year or so, and uh, recently. So uh, this will be a uh, kind of a semi-official club event. So our club members and various other invited astronomers are are coming down there. We have we have enough space, and some of them will be coming in Sunday night uh, to beat the traffic and also to be setting up their equipment, doing the polar alignments, and then either sleeping in their cars or pitching a tent and and. Uh, um, we are not really set up for a lot of people, but um, we will we'll do the best we can. Yeah. So, um, and especially because we, people don't want to try to come in on early, early Monday morning. They just want to be in place, and we're going to let them do that. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. There's um, a little bit of a delay in the. Uh, there is, yeah. Um, yeah, in, in, in what Daz and I see as live and what actually hits YouTube, there's about 30 second delay or so. Yeah. So we're just going to wait until any questions, any questions at all, whatever we haven't covered. Um, and and while we wait, uh, I'll say that um, we're both available and very responsive on our various social medias, on YouTube, uh, especially uh, if anyone has any questions after. Let us know in the comments of this video, or any video, really. Um, and we are more than happy to let you know. And it's usually very fast, if, if I say so myself. So we have, uh, if, if you look at YouTube.com, and uh, if you search for just, it's actually at Fort Worth Astronomical Society, you'll hit my channel. Um, and uh, uh, for NAS, it's Nastronomy. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, again, if, if you put any questions to, like, if you have any questions about safety, put in the safety video. Uh, I do get notifications for that. I, I try to reply as, as fast as I can. If you have any general astronomy questions, uh, we have a Facebook group, and it's Fort Worth Astro on Facebook. Um, and we have people who monitor the, uh, the, the PMs on there. So if you put something in, then um, we'll see that. If, um, if you're interested in the live stream that I'm planning, uh, if you go to the channel and go to the live videos, uh, it will be there. Um, hoping everything goes well and uh, I see that I will need to fix a bunch of things with <laughs> my live stream setup I tried something today and it did not go well so I had to redo something completely from scratch yeah and hopefully we'll do a um, follow-up after oh, yeah. after the eclipse um, because do a, I think we both want to see tell. each other's yeah definitely yeah yeah that should be fun so our, our plan is uh, we actually have our club meeting on Tuesday Mm -hmm. On the 19th? Yes. Tuesday the 19th at 7 p.m. Central Daylight Time now. It's been messing with my uh, my sleep patterns. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see. So we will be talking about the eclipse, about our eclipse planning. We will have um, talk about the sun funnels, how to build one for yourself very, very quickly if you have a small, cheap telescope. Um, and... Uh, that we talk about our plans and then our april meeting will be primarily a show and tell of where everyone went to show some pictures show some videos i probably won't be showing very many of mine because i will be using them for our social media so uh once i have good video good time lapse i will be creating the videos for our channel um and, and, and just doing that uh let's see uh, corin lewis is flying in oh, from london thank you Wow, that's a that's a that's a long flight, and uh, oh yeah, let's travel. Oof. I have a cousin in London; she will not she will not be joining us. So let's see. Yeah, and flying into San Antonio. Thanks. Remember, to San, San Antonio half of San Antonio will be out of the path of totality. Uh, San Antonio has a very very oh, lovely shit. river walk. It is it's a very very nice place. They did a just fantastic job with it. It is out of the path of totality. So. Yeah, just, uh, uh, just, yeah, just a quick share of what you're yeah, talking You'll have about to right go here. much further past. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Austin. Most of Austin, central Austin is covered, but most of San Antonio is not. Yeah. So people are flying into San Antonio and then staging out to go further deeper into the hill country. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I do and know also, someone flying into Houston who will then drive to us in Marble Falls. Oh, that's a waste. But Well, he's going there for work, so. <laughs> okay, that'll do. So something people don't realize, Texas is big. Texas is real big. You can drive all day and you're still in Texas. Okay. Yeah. In the meantime, up in the Northeast, you can drive all day and cross you know, how many five states? 
Yep. I have, have, have done it before. Yep. Yep. You can go quite a ways. I've, I've gone from here, from uh, Boston to uh, the Charleston, West, West Virginia, in a day. In like seven hours, I think, eight hours. Oh, yeah. Eight hours. You can drive eight hours in Texas. You're still in Texas. Yeah, yeah. That, that is no problem. <laughs> uh, in fact, it is closer from El Paso to Los Angeles than it is from El Paso to Beaumont. Really? Wow. Yes. That's, Seriously. That's crazy. The, the I-10 from uh, from Houston, yeah, Houston to San Antonio to uh, uh, to El Paso is just such a long, long, boring drive. It is. It, it, it's not one of my favorite drives. Um, I love West Texas, but I-10 out there is not my favorite drive. Yeah. So, I know uh, someone going to. I think I think Albuquerque. One of my uh, coworkers going to Albuquerque f- uh, for a couple of weeks because they have family, and then they're driving <laughs> to Texas uh, the weekend that is before. An all day drive. That's an all day uh, drive. Yeah. That's you leave in the morning and you get there at night. <clears throat> yeah. Take a yeah a two eighty seven. I've done that drive several times. Nice. I've never I've never been to the Southwest, so this will be my first. Uh, it, it's gorgeous. I, I I love it out there. I oh, it's been almost twenty years since uh, I last went hiking in the Grand Canyon, and I really really want to go back. Um, I want to go to the like Grand Canyon too. Like, yeah, yeah. We, we thought about going back last year, and uh, it just didn't work out. So that's fine. Anyone else driving to San Antonio? Six seven hours. Waking up early to drive to Kerrville. Yes. Um, the drives in in the hill country are absolutely gorgeous. Uh, I I love that area. It is it is fantastic. It's just not necessarily um, it, buy gas when you can. I would highly recommend it. Buy gas when you can, and you may have to deal with long lines. But um, fill up before you leave. When you get to where you're going, if you can find an empty gas station or without too many lines, buy gas again. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, my my, uh, my wife just texted me. She's hearing about all these drives, and she wrote in all caps, "I've done all these drives." She has traveled. She has traveled a lot more than I have. So, <laughs> and she has she family in, all, we're talking about. in in Texas, yeah. in Austin specifically. Yeah. It's one of the reasons Wait, we're going there. Yeah, in in uh, uh, we can do like a um, you can do a day trip from Dallas Fort Worth, and I've done this before. Dallas Fort Worth down to Marble Falls area, do Longhorn Cavern, then go over, hike Enchanted Rock uh, between Lano and Fredericksburg, mm-hmm. then head back up to Lano, stop at Cooper's Barbecue for food, take Highway 6 up past Lano on the way back home, stop over by Babyhead Cemetery, and find the dike that the road cuts through where you can find the only publicly accessible source of lanite in the world. Right, right. You know what me. lanite is? <laughs> lanite is a, uh, it is a pink granite, like, sort of like what the Texas State Capitol is made out of, except that instead of having white uh, quartz crystals, it has blue or purple quartz crystals. It is a very pretty rock. I have a bunch of it somewhere in the house that we've tumbled. <laughs> I have a bunch in the garage, which I haven't tumbled yet, that we took a couple months ago when we did this road trip and you can do this in one long day um but you still stay in texas and you don't even see a whole lot of texas <laughs> but it, it is a fun trip and um it is totally doable yeah. uh, if anyone wants to know where that dike is just look for baby head cemetery especially if, if you're a geologist if you love that kind of stuff mm-hmm. it's an interesting place it's right on the side of the road <clears throat> all you do is pull over and be sure you take a sledgehammer with you because that is a hard <laughs> You, you mean I can't okay. use my fist? <laughs> Not if you want to, you know, turn it into a, you know, a pulpy mess. No. <laughs> it is, it is a very hard rock. Right. Uh, um, Richard McFarland asked to talk about camera settings one more time. Okay, so I would highly recommend. Um, okay, first of all, camera settings are really, really, really specific to your camera your camera is set like basically what type of camera you have um 
and what lens or telescopes you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you have a full frame sensor, if you have an APS-C, if you're using micro, excuse me, micro four thirds, um, that matters. Um, your ISO settings matter as well. I just keep it on 100 because I want the best picture quality I can. Um, then it depends on your lenses. So are you using a, um, a kit lens that only goes up to f3.5 at its widest? Mm -hmm. Are you using a the like the mid-range stuff, the Canon ultrasonics that go to f1.4 for this 50 millimeter? Are you using... Um, Oh, shoot, I already put all my stuff away. Uh, I have cinema lenses, which use T-stops, which mm -hmm. are calculated, not a ratio like F-stops. Or telescopes. Um, small telescopes like that uh, That little astrograph. Mm -hmm. That's a neat one. Mm -hmm. uh, I like that. Yeah, yeah. it's one of, my, um, one of the ones I'm using. So all that depends. How big is your aperture? What's your focal length? What camera do you have? And from there you can figure out what all of your settings are. And I'm actually going back to, oh, excuse me, to Javier's site, because, or Xavier's site. Ah. I, I've been calling him <clears throat> Javier because uh, he's French, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, while while you sweet. pull that up, I, I will mention that uh, my, my last video where I did a full walkthrough of uh, SetNC, which is the automation software for imaging, I go over uh, a couple of resources you can use to figure out what your ISO settings, what your exposure settings should be. I, I cover Javier's website as well because he has a really nice calculator. Yeah, um, I'm trying to find where the calculator is. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, so eclipses, lunar right, eclipses. Then. So I see the list. Oh, jeez. Yeah, that music is. Uh, the music is on his page. Yeah, I've, I found it here. I'll, I'll okay. share. Okay, that'll work. And we can do we can do like a quick little uh, example. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so we can use um, here. here you, do, do you want to tell me what, what uh, you want to set? APS yeah, set? let's do uh, altitude. This, well, okay, let's just do um, uh, chromosphere. Here we go. So click on, or no, no, let's do corona. Let's do corona. So uh, lower corona, mm -hmm. inner corona, middle corona. Let's try middle corona. Middle corona. Oh no! Never mind. Never mind. So this is like the settings on top. So where is that's your sensitivity to your ISO? There we go. Okay, full frame sensor. Let's mm -hmm. let us let us change the settings frame. on here. So full frame. Mm -hmm. Let's do uh, Canon um, APS-C. Yep. <clears throat> that's gonna be more common. Three and. Three. A 300 millimeter, that's going to be that Canon kit lens, mm -hmm. the 70 to 300 kit lens. Yep, that's what I'm using. And so, yep, that's all set. And, altitude and body, is let's change the body to some Canon, some of the 850. Yeah, I think this is only for the sampling. It doesn't really matter for this, but... Uh, there we go. Canon, um, uh, scroll down, keep going down. Oh, no, it doesn't do it that way. Okay, go up, and I think, let's do the 300, 300D it has it no That's okay 400. 600d is that the 600d 600d yeah which is the yeah, t3i <clears throat> three which one t3i the 600 perfect that, that's the one i want mm -hmm. okay so focal length let's do 300 okay that'll work and so now we have the timing here mm -hmm. so if you're going to do the middle corona you need one sixth of a second at iso 100 and f8 that's what you're yeah, using. Yeah, at F8. So if you have a, yeah, if, if you stop it down to F8. Yeah, for for me, I, I actually like doing ISO 200. So my, my settings are a little bit different. So yeah, like 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 Chris said, um, look up, definitely like visit this and maybe take some practice shots of what you'd like, see what you, what you like for the partial phases. And then you can keep the settings the same, keep your F ratios the same, keep the sensitivity the same. Uh, and then come to this site and it'll tell you what your shutter speed should be so that during the during eclipse photography you're only changing one one setting and not three and this is why automation is really important mm -hmm. uh, for eclipse orchestrator i have a shutter cable and a usb cable connected to the computer i'm oh, sorry connected from the computer to the the camera right the camera set up manual mode the computer will change the settings on the camera for all these different uh, phases of the eclipse. Mm -hmm. So literally, I let it go. I don't touch anything. I let it handle 
everything. That's yep. what automation should be. Yep. My hands are off. Yep. I'm listening. I can take a quick look at what it's doing, but it gives me a timeline of everything that's going to happen, and then I'm good to go. Like, yeah. I'm fine, and I can go enjoy myself while the automation does its work. Yep. So yep. <clears throat> this is assuming that you're doing everything manually. Yeah. Yep, exactly. But it does give you that idea about mm -hmm. what you need. And like like Nat said, if he says it, he does it for um, uh, ISO 200. I have mine typically set for 100. Um, it There's not a hard and fast rule for that. Mm -hmm. uh, if your ISO is set to be 200, you increase your noise a little bit, but you're taking faster exposures. Yep. Um, this can be important. You don't need the fancy tracking mounts like we have. You really don't need them. Mm -hmm. You can get away with this eclipse with a camera on a tripod. As long as your eclipse, sorry, as long as your uh, exposures are short enough, it won't move enough to matter. Yeah. Okay. So there's something called the rule of 700. I think it's 700. So you take the um, your focal length. Oh, sorry. 700 divided by whatever your focal length is, and that is the longest. Uh, exposure that you can take without stars starting to trail in your nighttime photography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, so, and and Javier's website here, this the, he has an exposure limit without tracking for your uh, camera yeah. settings, which is really nice. It's like half a second for for this setup. Yep. So whatever you have with that lens, you can't have any exposure longer than one half second. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, and it's. That that's that's really neat. So, uh, if can you can you just drop that in the in the chat so people can have it and just click click yes. on it right away. Yes. There you go. <clears throat> I have uh, have another question from Rich at Deep Space Astro. So, can this use be can this be used for an astro cam with gain instead of ISO? Maybe start at Unity gain and work from there. Um, no, not yeah. this one. Yeah. And frankly, I haven't seen anyone who has a um, who, who's been doing an astro camera calculator for eclipses, which sucks because I'm going to have four astro cameras imaging. <laughs> um, what I can say is this. <clears throat> I'm using SharpCat Pro. There is a script um, that the developer of SharpCat Pro, Sharp Pro came up with, and it will... <clears throat> It will do bracketing for images. That's the best way I can describe it. So um, we talk about bracketing very briefly. Eclipse Orchestrator for me will be programmed so that it takes images of all the different phases. So when totality starts with Bailey's beads, I'm taking certain exposures. When diamond ring hits, I'm taking certain exposures. <clears throat> Once it's totality, or sorry, then I take images of prominences, then I take images of the chromosphere. Or is it chromosphere? Then yep. prom yeah, yeah, promises chromosphere. and chromosphere. After that, I start my coronal images. I will start off with, like, let's say, um, can you go ahead and click on inner corona? Let's see what it says. One one hundredth of a second. So that's okay. what I said. Uh, so there you go. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually starting off with one five hundredth of a second, I think, for mine. I will take three, no, wait, sorry. I have five images at one one hundredth. Then five images at one fiftieth, five images at one twenty fifth, five images at <clears throat> one fifteenth, one tenth, one fifth, one fourth, one half, one two, and then I repeat, and I go through that pattern. I keep repeating. I keep repeating, and then when I get to the deepest part of the, I think I'll be able to get two, two of these um, these uh, sequences. Mm -hmm. two sets for the first half of the eclipse. Then in the deepest part of the eclipse, I will have it open for, I think, 10 seconds. Um, no, no, I have five seconds. I have five second exposures, uh, and I have five of them, five or six of them. And those are going to be getting my earth shine and my stars. Mm -hmm. So uh, earth shine is the light from the sun that's reflected off of the earth that hits the moon that is reflected back to us. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at a, a very thin crescent moon at sunset or at sunrise, and you can kind of see 
the shape of the moon against the sky, that's Earth shine off the moon. So yeah. we, we may be able to see some of it, especially if we don't have, like, if we have high clouds, it's kind of off. But if, uh, like, thin clouds tend to, to get rid of all that. Yeah. But if we, if it's a clear sky, we should be able to see a little bit of Earth shine, get that image, get the, get the, uh, get the stars. And then my sequencer will, will start over again. And this lets me get deep and, um, I'll be able to see the the deep corona, but I'll be able to see the inner corona as well. And I'll be able to process that later to get a full image of everything. Because your eyes are far, far better and more sensitive than any camera mm -hmm. that we have yep. at the moment. Okay. So what that means is at this moment, your eyes are super sensitive. Okay. Cameras have to gather pixels for a long period or gather photons for a long period of time to make an image. Sometimes a very, very short period of time, sometimes a very, very long period of time. Essentially, every one of your rods and cones in your eye are an independent sensor. Yep. So you can easily see a wide range of, of brightness in a scene and still get details where a camera, like if I'm looking out here, I can see what's behind my desk. I can see details on my wall, even though it's not lit. It's getting enough light for me that I can see a little bit. At the same time, I'm looking at the screens and I can easily see what's on the screen. And my eyes don't have to adjust for the brightness very much to see both. Mm -hmm. With a camera, either you see the screen or you see the background and the screen is blown out. So it's like a, a good example. If you take a picture inside of a house and uh, part of the window is in frame, the window will be blown out if you can see what's in the house. But if you expose for what's outside the window, Everything in the house is going to be dark. Yep. Your eyes don't work that way. Cameras do work this way. So mm -hmm. we have to replicate what our eyes can do with these cameras. What, replicate what our eyes do with cameras using these tricks and techniques in order to, you know, just get it done. Yeah. I'll, I'll quickly share what my exposure yeah. table in um, Set NC looks like to to show you what it's talking about um so let's see is it showing can you see my set nc exposure table yeah yeah so it's it's, it's just yeah, like this loop, right. 98 yeah so yeah you can see that it just looping from one one thousandth of a second all the way to four seconds for earthshine and this can go up to eight seconds so it's pretty much what what chris was describing that um we need to do some tricks with the camera because we need to be able to take all of these different exposures and then create an HDR image or high definition resolution uh, image um, that high we, dynamic range high dynamic range <laughs> thank you uh, that our eyes can do naturally which is which is amazing um, yeah so tricks trick tips and tricks yep everything is a trick everything is a little trick it, it doesn't matter what it is whether it's imaging, whether it's video, whether it's programming, everything that we do is essentially a trick. And it's a it's a technique that we do to take data that we have, but it's not really in the form we want it, mm -hmm. or in a form we can easily visualize, and turn it into something that we can. You know, for example, um, <clears throat> astro imaging. All the images that we take, all the images that Hubble takes, all that stuff, it's dim. You can barely see anything except for mm -hmm. some pinpoint stars. Mm -hmm. And that's it. So I can take a, a five minute exposure, I can take a 10 minute exposure. And if I just look at my raw data, all I see is little pinholes. That's it. Just little bitty dots, not even everywhere, just a couple of the brightest stars get little dots in my image. And if you're looking at it, you just go, well, this sucks. <laughs> I, I, it's supposed to be such a, a gorgeous image, like all these astrophotographers do. You know, why can't I get an image like that? Because you have to process it. Yeah. And you have to do histogram stretching, and you have to do stacking to get rid of all the noise, and and all these different techniques, and and driving out to a dark sky site three hours from your house because <clears throat> because the lights in town, you know, um, uh, get rid of details in your images. Um, you have to drag in all your equipment somewhere with batteries because there's no power out there. And you have to sit in the dark for three or four hours, uh, or all night actually, and, and image the same thing over and over and over again to come home mm -hmm. to realize that, that your focus was off, your tracking was off, <laughs> something else. Yeah. So, 
But if you have Too good data, real. you get good data, and then you process your good data, and you do all these little tricks to it in order to get good data. Mm -hmm. um, do you use uh, a PixInsight? Uh, I've used PixInsight, but it's not. I don't use it now. I use AstroPixel Processor as my primary, yeah. followed by Cyril yeah. as my secondary. Because APP is easy. It's super easy. Yeah. It's very, very easy. I use it too. It is super easy. And you can go from data to an image you can actually work with in Photoshop in mm -hmm. like half an hour. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I love about Pixel Insight is really detailed. There's a neat thing called Pixel Math. And yep. what you can do is you can say, okay, I have this data for, excuse me, I have data for this um this frequency of light this band pass mm -hmm. and i have data for this band pass and i have yeah. data for this band pass what if my images i use this for red this which is also red but i'm turning it to green mm -hmm. and this which is kind of blue green i make it really blue and i use the hubble palette or i can even do stuff like okay take this light subtract add or multiply this light mm -hmm. and assign that value to a different color. Mm -hmm. And so now you're seeing, you can visualize regions where there's oxygen and hydrogen, okay? And separate that out from regions where there's just hydrogen or just oxygen. Mm -hmm. And it, you can highlight those colors more. And it's that, was it Fornax processing? I think Fornax, I think sounds, that's what it is. Sounds right, yeah. We call it pixel math. Yeah, and C it's Cyril really also has pixel math now, um, which I've used, which is which is really nice. Yeah, it, yeah it's it's yeah. super cool APP. stuff. APP is working tricks. on it. Yeah, I, I think the developer yeah. of APP is working on pixel math, which which cool. I'm really looking forward to. There's also um, <clears throat> I was going to say for the eclipse, those really cool images. There's like a German guy who who does fantastic images of the eclipse, and he's the first one who kind of came up with this method using wavelets. And right, it's, yes. it's actually finding density differences in the corona and then highlighting those density differences. Right. It's, and it's math-based. It's all math. And I tried doing it, and it didn't come out very well for mine. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll try again with, with data from this year. I think it'll yeah. be a little bit cleaner this year. Yeah. But you see these, these, these streams. Uh, let's see if we can find it. just an image of his. Um, uh, you, while, while you look, uh, I'll, I'll just mention that you answered Susan Todd's question. But for anyone who yes. can't see the chat, uh, Susan asked, um, you're, you need solar glasses for Bailey Speeds and Diamond Ring, right? And the answer is you don't. Uh, wait, you do not need glasses for... Yeah, um, you do not need glasses for Diamond Rings and Bailey Speeds. Right, okay. Yeah. Here we go. Is this it? Oh, yeah. No? Is that her? Uh, Eclipse Photography homepage, maybe. Yeah, I think. Uh... Oh, there we go. Yeah, here we go. So let's go to that page. That's it. Uh, I'm still trying to bring it up here. Yeah. Here we go. Uh, sorry, sorry. I don't want to meet, keep hanging on it. But uh, do you mean like uh, solar filter for your cameras for Bailey Speeds and Diamond Ring? Or eclipse glasses, because I think uh, you might need gla eclipse glasses for for um, diamond ring, right? Because it's still a little bit too bright. No, no, diamond ring is you. You do not need eclipse glasses. Really? Hmm, okay. Really? Okay. Interesting. So, let's see, here we go. Mirror swap, yeah, Druk Mueller. So these, mm -hmm. all these like these details within here, this is what we call wavelet processing. Right. So you can't see these with your naked eye. Right. You just can't. Right. Okay. But by processing the image, by pulling out the data that's already in the images, mm -hmm. by stacking the images, we can see this kind of detail. That's a beautiful picture. So some of it is behind, some of it is in, in front. It's really hard to tell what's where. Yeah. But this gives you that uh, it's a three-dimensional corona flattened in two dimensions that is more understandable. And again, it's a really, really cool technique, but this is all post-processing. This is, this is all math. Mm -hmm. And in this case, this is also a, a, um, a composite 
because I believe what they did with this one mm -hmm. is um, uh, the image of the moon was taken six months after the eclipse uh. when the moon was in the same location and then it was composited onto the shadow like Interesting. this. Interesting. Okay. I tried that and when it was my time to take the images it was like super cloudy that entire time and I, I, I tried to also get a picture of the sky mm -hmm. uh, at that time with a wide angle lens so I could then do this kind of compositing and uh, no. It's <laughs> It, it, it's hard, right? Because the moon is also not going to be in the same distance from the Earth. Yes. So you'd have to uh, do a little bit of manipulation, uh, like uh, sp sp make it smaller or larger. Yeah, so I'm not, yeah. not going to be doing that. Um, um, <laughs> we, we, have, we have one question from Hangar Bird. He said, uh, the link I've referenced um, about the shutter speed doesn't seem to match what, what Fred Espinek's chart shows. Not even close. I'm not understanding why it is so far off. So, I think it's uh, I think Fred Espinex. So the thing about Javier's website is that it's dynamic. Uh, it, it takes input, and we are able to tell it what kind of gear we have, and it gives us a recommendation. I think Fred Espinex is based on his gear, um, and I think either way, all of this should be used as guidance. Like don't you don't use it as like, yeah, this site told me one one hundredth of a second, and that's what I'm going to use for my eight hundred millimeter focal length uh, camera. It's not going to work. You know, you need. I think. It's you definitely need to practice. Um, that's like you know one of my lessons learned. I talked about it earlier that you need to practice, 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 even if it's one day before the eclipse. You know, just just see what you like on the partial phase eclipses, and then and then go from there. Uh, again, use as guidance, not as word of God. And remember, that's why I said I, I I'm doing bracketing. So okay, mm -hmm. fine. One one hundredth of a second for inner corona. Great, fantastic. I'm still gonna do one five hundredth of a second. Yep. Because. If I get the lower end, I'm getting the higher end. Right. So, and especially when you when you think about images, um, black is not black. Right. But white is white. Okay. Mm -hmm. If black can be just a super dark gray, but you still have data in there. Right. But if you blow out your image, if all you see is is highlights, if all you have is white, that's lost data. Okay. Um, in, in video, we call it, you know, we have, uh, the, the cameras have, um, the, they're called zebra settings. So if you're looking at your monitor and you see these stripes going across the screen, that's places where you've lost data because it's all white. So we don't want all white. We want to keep the image dark because we can stretch the histogram and pull data out of that. Mm -hmm. if, if the image is super bright, and there's white just all around that entire inner inner corona is completely white we, we've lost that data yep so yeah yeah oh, i, I don't mind it, it's easier to correct for a little bit of underexposure and it's almost impossible to correct for a lot of overexposure right yeah so exactly yeah yeah i hope i hope that answers your question um hanger bird and yeah. brackets 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 if you do brackets then you get the low end, and then you may get the high end. And if if you overexpose on the high end, toss out those images; they're waste. Don't worry about it. Work with what you get. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. And if you can, automation will definitely help with the bracketing. Oh yeah, right. I next... I couldn't I couldn't do this without automation. There's no, me no neither. All right, next question from Brendan's Games. Uh, so if an it yep. image is dark, it's fine. Blown out white, it's done for. Yes. I'm saying okay. fine. Sleep, <clears throat> Think of it I this guess. way. Okay, on the chips, um, every chip has. Should I have a camera with me? Get another there. Okay, um, every sensor has a limit to the number of electron volts that it can handle. Basically, how many photons can actually hit the sensor before the sensor maxes out? Mm -hmm. Different sensors have different limits. So some of the older CMOS ones and CCDs, they can only handle let's say um, 15,000, 5,000 photons. They were super sensitive, but that also meant that they got full, the well got full. We actually call them wells. So if you have a, um, if you have a sensor that is, uh, has 15,000 electron volts in the well, that means that you can have um, 
as long as the, the the photons keep hitting it, it will fill up, fill up, fill up. But once it hits that maximum, that's it. Mm -hmm. Okay, whatever additional photons hit it, it doesn't change anything. And on some of the older ones, older like CCDs, it would actually bleed over onto the onto the adjoining pixels. So if you had one star on one pixel and it filled up that well, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it would start filling up the pixels around it. And that's useless data. That doesn't mm -hmm. tell you anything yep. about the start. It's yep. spillover. Mm -hmm. So even with the newer chips where you have 100,000 plus electron volts in a well per pixel, um, if you max it out, anything hitting that from then on is lost data. Mm -hmm. So if it's white, it's lost. Yep. Okay. If it's maxed out, it's lost. If it's a little bit below that, that's still okay. But just if you're looking at a histogram, what you don't want is everything way over in black where it bumps up against the black. There's like a, it, like you're, here's your black limit and the histogram will do this. You don't necessarily want this, mm -hmm. okay? You want kind of like a light slope up to it. Mm -hmm. You can have a lot of black pixels, but you want you want this and not this. Mm -hmm. yep. And on the white side, you don't even want it touching. You want it coming up close. You don't want this and you definitely don't want this on the white side. So when I was doing the hydrogen alpha imaging, I made sure that my histogram went about 60%. I had a nice little bump at 60%, mm -hmm. but it didn't go past. And that gives me room to stretch the histogram over to the white, mm -hmm. if I absolutely have to, yep. or stretch it out to the black in, in different directions. And you can play with a lot, but you don't want to bump your histogram up against the white, definitely not, because then you lose data. And you don't want it way over to, the, to, uh, to be like climbing up on the black side, because that means you're not getting enough data. Mm -hmm. So you need, if it's way over on the black, you need longer exposures. If it's way over on the white, you need shorter exposures. Yep, yep. I, uh, I, I posted a video maybe like a year ago on on the histogram, on how to how to <clears throat> tell what a, a good histogram is and like how you can make corrections of it later on. It wasn't very popular, but it's pretty much uh, pretty much what you described. Uh, it's the black and white clipping. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, and I, I'd also recommend, um, Queeve the Lazy Geek, he has a really good video on ADUs uh, and full wells, and he explains it with some diagrams on how those actually works. If anyone wants a um, like a visual explanation of how how those are filling up, it's it's really really interesting. Yeah, m mine was kind of a quick and dirty. Yeah, no, I did. No, it, it totally makes sense too. Like it's, uh, I think I think it was a great explanation. Um, Thank you. Yeah. I mean, of, of course, like, I understand what you're talking about, so I could be yeah. a little bit biased. I'm like, yeah, of course. Full a well? Yeah, I mean, I know what you're talking about. Electron volts? Yeah. 100,000? Yeah, well, think of it like a well in the ground. Yeah. It's like you keep filling up with water. If it spills over to the top, you can keep adding buckets of water, but you're not adding to anything. It's it's just wasted. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah. one of the neat things about, um, about like, uh, uh, modern-day video cameras is that you do have a, especially a professional level video cameras at least, that you do have an option to turn on the, the Zebra. Because right. I remember old cameras from the 1990s, you would, like camcorders, you would be recording something and you don't necessarily know if it's really overexposed unless you're really paying attention. And now right. it's like instantly, if you see Zebras, nah, nah, it's, it's, I've lost data there. Mm -hmm. So you knock down your exposure, you, um, like on one of my cameras, uh, I have built-in ND filters. I can just, I literally hit a button and it drops down like ND one, two, or three. Yeah. And um, and that that'll make the scene, you know, darker, which is what you want. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, but the zebras make it really obvious. It's like you're you're, you're filming something. Oh yeah, drop it right away. Yeah, for sure. <sighs> All right, we I think are... that'll do. We've been on here for almost three hours. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I, know. I think we, we had talked earlier we were only going to be doing one hour and then probably a little Q&A. So. Yeah. Right. But that's fine. I have to go to work tomorrow. Um, me too. I mean, I'm working from home, but I, I have to oh. wake up. Oh, tomorrow's my office day. I have to wake up. And unfortunately, this week with the daylight savings time change, I've been getting up at like 7 o'clock because it's been super dark still. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I will, um, yeah, right. I've got to go get ready for tomorrow. Yep. Well, thanks and, for, um, thanks for this. And thanks to everyone no, who, thank you. who joined. Um, again, send us questions. We are around. We are very responsive, uh, especially on YouTube. So, yep. And, There's uh, not a whole lot of time left. Nope. So two I weeks. think we have 20, 
20 days, 21 days, I think is what it is. Oh, according to, no, oh, eight, right, yeah, 21 days. Clips Orchestrator kicked on, it was like 20 days and something hours earlier mm -hmm. today. Like yeah, right, so, right. Yeah, set it, 20 set it days, as well. Not a lot of time, and that basically means one this weekend, next two more weekends. Two more weekends. Two more weekends. Yeah. Two more weekends. Yeah, but I have, I think, 15 or 16 days before I have to leave because uh, we're driving. Should be fun. Yep. Pack up. Pack up, pack up. Gotta pack. Yeah. Gotta pack. To, oh my god. Okay. All right. It was, this was fun. Get, okay. Cool. Thanks. Thank everyone. you, and thank you for everyone who's watching on both our channels. Um, and uh, yeah, have a good night. Have a good uh, night. I'm Chris Moditsky with the Fort Worth Astronomical Society. I'm Nas from Nastronomy. Okay. And uh, good night, everyone. And we hope to see uh, a good eclipse, and hope y'all are able to see a good eclipse too.